Welcome everyone to Comics from the Multiverse, episode 224, at least I think it is. This is the DC Comics podcast. I am Peter, and joining me is Connor. Did, do I not get an as always yet? No, you're not Matt. Well, I know, but I feel like if I'm if I'm now second billing, I should get that anyway. You're not second billing. Absent Matt is second billing. You're... Not according to the way you just introed that show, it wasn't. Shut up, Luke. Just accept your intro as it is, and we will get into uh, this week's DC Comics, which include a relatively short list. Uh, we have Death Metal, Robin King, issue one, which Connor had to read as well, even though he didn't want to, because of Patreon. <laughs> uh, then we also have Batman 101, we got Justice League 55, Catwoman 26, Aquaman 64, and I also did a, a Patreon book this week, so you'll be hearing me talk about American Vampire issue 12. Uh, so that's what's coming up on the week's show. Um, yeah, also some news. Uh, mostly just little tidbits and uh, various things. One movie thing that I thought was worth mentioning, um, but nothing super... Uh, Exciting. Not to get you all hyped before I start the news by saying, hey, it's all shit and boring. Just brace yourselves. Uh, Strap in. Of, I got a couple of little interesting tidbits of news that, you know, may, may get something from us. I hope they're interesting. Because the fact that Amethyst has been delayed for more. <laughs> <laughs> for more. You, you, again, I believe was the word. Well, no, it's because I was reading the title and they say 10 weeks, but it's not 10 more weeks. It's now 10 weeks total because Newsarama insists on wording it incorrectly every yeah. single time. Yeah, it, it's only an extra, like, that. that's surely only an extra week or two from what it was before. Yeah, it was maybe November 24th. Uh, the new date now is December 1st. Obviously, November 24th was after, like, several other delays, but that's yeah. what it was scheduled. Now it's December 1st. Still before the end of the year, which admittedly, given how much it keeps getting pushed back, it may be 2021 by the time it comes out, but for now, <laughs> December. Not impossible. I think it was supposed to come out like two weeks ago, originally. So, that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's that. Qu quick, quick and clever. Uh, interesting little thing here is apparently in the last issue of Batgirl, uh, the character who is going to be Batwoman on the TV show in season two debuted in the comic. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to read the article here from Newsarama because I, I didn't. I just sort of saw the headline and thought, you know what? Yeah, we can talk about that. That's interesting. Uh, so. Uh, from the pages of Batgirl issue 50, DC will introduce a new version of Batwoman in the pages of October 27th's Batgirl issue 50. Uh, so this is next week's issue, I assume then. Uh, not... Yes. Yeah, we're not at the 27th yet. <laughs> Good. No, no, we are not. So it's an oversized issue, Mars the title's current volume. The new Batwoman, Ryan Wilder, uh, based on the version of the character that will take over as the lead of the next uh, season of Bat uh, Batwoman on TV. Um, so, yeah, interesting. Why so. Not? You'll be seeing Weldon in the comics uh, right now. Uh, so basically they were asking if we're going to see her in the comics. It's like, well, actually, as it happens, next week <laughs> you're going to be getting her in Batgirl issue 50. So, yeah. Um, I don't know if there's much more... I mean, I think beyond that, it's just maybe teasing what's actually going to be in the issue. But there is a, there's, a, there's a panel here in the article uh, of the character kind of in a hoodie. So it's an interesting tactic to introduce them both in the comics and on the show at the same time even if in the comic you know will she someday take the mantle of batwoman maybe maybe they'll go down that path eventually if they want to do it maybe yeah, they be might soon. Do. if, if but, there's a good re reception especially i think they'll want to but at least right now uh it seems like a fun little uh, tease admittedly it's a weird place to do it in batgirl issue 50 which is supposed to be that think, book's finale but it is i think what's frustrating on probably on dc's part more than anything is the timing because in a normal year around about now is when this show would be starting to air mm -hmm. yeah. uh so it would have lined up in a in a traditional uh cw season start with it being delayed to january this time and then obviously we're doing we're, we're busy in january with other stuff there's nowhere really else to put it closer to the time i guess yeah I think 
there is concern sometimes when they try to show her in TV characters that, you know, were in the comics originally into the comics. And, you know, we've seen examples with Arrow and things like that. I think this is a little bit different in the sense that the character is basically starting from scratch at the same time in both. So, I mean, I'm sure there's been some collaboration. Like, I'm, I'm sure, like, when they put this character in the comics, they'd speak, spoken to the writers of the show and said, hey, what's she like? <laughs> like yeah, it's it's hard to really say this is a bad thing, though, because there are just as many good examples of TV characters moving over to comics as there are, you know, bad ones. Harley Quinn, yes. I know. We're, we're, probably some others from Batman and animated then, series. Think, uh, Montoya, maybe? From, from yeah, Batman. that sounds right. I think Montoya's one, and then, And even even more recently, in terms of live-action stuff, uh, obviously you mentioned Arrow characters. Uh, that alone has good and bad examples. Like, Felicity was a, a bad example, where it felt like they were trying to capitalize on it. Uh, Diggle, I thought, actually worked, you know, it has been in multiple different runs, different stories, and felt pretty cohesive. Diggle's kind of just... I think Diggle just breaks even. There's he's, nothing he's bland there's no, enough that you get away with it. Yeah, there's nothing particularly good about him either, but he, there's nothing offensive bad about him. So it's just kind of... He's just there there. Like, yeah. He could be any dude. He doesn't really have to be called Diggle. He could be he could be Jim. <laughs> that, no, that that is very fair. So... I don't know, that's what it is. But I thought it was interesting. And I, I hadn't seen anyone. This was only when I, you know, I thought, I'll check if there's been any news, you know, before we started. And I saw this and went, oh, I didn't know about this. Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, next up, more digital first coming. Or more precisely, the digital first that were there before are returning. So this, these were the ones that used to be the reprints of the Walmart specials are coming back for limited runs. Uh, the, the first one is the Wonder Woman book, Agent of Peace, is coming back for a four-issue run which will start on October 21st and run weekly for four weeks, and then that'll be it. And maybe it'll come back again later, but it's Does going it... to have a little four-issue anthology style. That's cool. Does it tell us which team is? Uh, it's a variety here, but it looks like it just lists oh, okay. a series of careers. Uh, contributions from uh, Ivan Cohen, Pop Man, Amanda De Dalebert, Aaron Lepresti, Danny Lore, Maria Laura Sanapo, and Andrew Wheeler with Paul Pelletier. So quite a list i assume that's yeah, just i recognize a handful of yeah. those at least that sounds like it's just four different teams probably it, it could even be slightly more because in the past on these issues when they when they released them some of them were here's one team one story some of them were you know two stories with different teams in them as well so it could mm. be a bit of a mix and match it sounds like at the very least there'll be four different teams if not it does. yeah more than that uh, and they're planning more Superman, Man of Tomorrow, and Batman Gotham Knights, which will be solicited sometime soon. Uh, of course, solicits for these digital firsts are kind of weird, because they just kind of pop up quite close to when they come out, because they're not like the regular solicits. Yeah, and do you know what's really interesting about these, uh, or at least interesting to me, is on DC Universe, these show up really quick. Cause, so obviously most books mm. have a, a year delay from when they publish them to when they show up on DC uh, Universe. So, soon to be six months. Soon to be six months, yes, when they relaunched it. But right now, it's it's supposed to be a year. But they're already halfway through the uh, the, the Harley Quinn uh, black and white and red. That's already like half of that's up on DC Universe already. When, when, when that was that? Uh, only in the last few months, because that ca that launched after all the other digital first ones were over the break. So. Not that long ago, that first issue. I mean, it's pretty fine now in Comicsology, but it's not. Yeah, maybe maybe the digital first were already on six months then, or something like that. Uh, uh, maybe it even could less, be. but um, yeah, I guess it makes some kind of sense. Um, but yeah, so the covers for the the three of those issues, which are thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. Uh, of that book i think it's interesting they're, they're keeping the naming and numbering of because they could have just called this something else this could have just been you know some other wonder woman subtitle just but give it a one to four yeah but it's, it's interesting to me they're keeping these titles and saying hey we can take breaks and come back but they're essentially a place for anthology stories sometimes it'll be a multi-issue arc sometimes it'll just be a lot of one-offs yeah uh i'm for it uh, i did just check harley quinn um that first issue released on comiXology at the end of june so, like, it's, it's, what, three or four months at most by the time they were publishing them on, on DC Universe? Yeah. Um, I will say, the only downside to this uh, style is that it does make me less inclined to want to commit to continuing a book indefinitely. It's more like, 
Oh, if there's a team on a particular issue that seems interesting, I'll That's uh, dive in. what I used to do with the uh, the Legend of the Dark Knight and Adventures of Superman that they had mm -hmm. in their first like set of digital firsts a few years ago. I would just kind of keep an eye on e each week, just keep an eye on what the teams were and check out the ones that interested me. Yeah, which is you know, it's, it's a bit more awkward. Admittedly, if this is the sort of thing that it could, I mean, there I see these digital first might become day and day on DC Universe when everything relaunches. They're kind of implied that there would be ex exclusives. May not be, may not be these books specifically, but this is the sort mm. of thing where if they did go to DC Universe kind of just day one, and you if you you got them for free if you were part of that service, then that's the sort of thing where I maybe would be inclined to check out all these random names that I don't recognize. Where I'm like, oh, you know what? No, it's free. I'll read it. <laughs> I'll, I'll yeah, see what it's like. And they're already not a huge commitment if you're just interested in, you know, one series. Right? Like, for example, if you're just wanting the Wonder Woman series, it's only a dollar an issue. Uh, so it's not a huge commitment to try. Um, no, but not it, at all. That does add up, admittedly. Yeah, I think it's the sort of thing where once uh, DC Universe relaunches, and if this becomes more of a consistent thing, it could be, it could almost be a weekly segment on the show. Is okay, what was the the free digital first book this week that's worth trying? Uh, kind of thing. Yeah, the problem is there'll probably be like five to seven books every week at that point. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, but that many? That's that's they used to have seven. Uh, they used to have one a day uh, when they were in full swing. So I would not be surprised to see them kind of get back to that sort of schedule. They had four or five a day during when, when they had these books that we're talking about now. Uh, when they had them going, it was one a day. I think they had at least five. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a bit awkward to start seven books in one week, I suppose. But if as long as they're staggered and that some are ongoing and we've not decided we're not reading the next amount of them and we're just trying the new teams on various books, I don't see it being too much of, a, of an issue. But... Until it's like this where it's a different team on every issue. <laughs> True, true, yeah. If they're all like that, then all of a sudden, yeah, it's like seven. But, I mean, hell, maybe, maybe the main books will all be terrible at that point, and we'll be, we'll be welcoming them with open arms. I don't know. You never know. But at least uh, it's curious all the same. So uh, more digital first books coming, so that's just uh, just coming up. October 21st, what day is that? Have we just passed that? I think we just passed that. Yeah, yeah, that. it's the 24th now. So that was what, Thursday? No. Uh, something like that? No. Wednesday. Wednesday, all right. Okay, so yeah. So next three Wednesdays, you get next three issues. If you're writing more Wonder Woman stories, you can check that out. Uh, next up, uh, this is an interesting one here, although maybe not exciting per se, but uh, curious just because of everything that's went on this year, is that DC are actually getting rid of one of their distributors and they're switching all completely to Lunar uh, for their sole distributor in North America. Obviously, Diamond UK are still going to be the, the UK distributors and so that's on. That is the permanent situation now as well. They up, they cl clarified that over the last mm. two months. So, I know. Um, so yeah, basically from January first, twenty twenty one, their dealings with UCS are going to be going away. And I think that maybe just says that they've not necessarily been dissatisfied with them, but they've been so happy with Lunar's partnership. That I, they're uh, just... I I did a bit more reading into this, and it seems there's a bit more going on because mm. it seems like UCS are the ones who who said. Who pulled out essentially? Oh, okay. That's um, interesting. Basically, there are some new stipulations from Luna. I don't know if your article has those in there. Um, where uh, if you're ordering from Luna going forward, you have to order uh, either $125 worth a week or $500 uh, a month. If you don't hit that, they won't ship out to you until you next reach over that limit and we'll uh, sell you them then. Uh, so that's kind of like a minimum fee, which for small stores, given that this is just one publisher, um, might impact them. And there are other things where you have to meet like one of a certain three criteria, which was uh, either you're a brick and mortar store, you have a dedicated online store direct to consumer, or uh, there was a third one. And it, it was basically saying you can't use eBay, as a, you can't use an eBay store, uh, auction sites as your primary store. Um, and it seems like the assumption is these these mandates coming from DC, not Luna, and UCS didn't want to kind of be involved in this, and that's kind of why they pulled out by the sounds of it. Okay, I have nothing to add to that, but no. there you go. Uh, so that's that. Um, that was the comic book specific stuff I had. I don't know if you had anything else. Uh, let me have a quick glance. Oh, I do have. A couple of little bits. Well, one's more interesting than the other. I'll do the little one first. Uh, basically, just 
uh, DC's told retailers that they've cancelled all the orders for Teen Titans Volume 4, Robin No More, and the third volume of Swamp Thing, The Bronze Age, which is the one collecting the final pre alan Moore issues of the series. Um, so not even a place to start, but okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sucks. Um, and I guess orders weren't there for it wasn't whether we spoke about this before that their system for ordering and kind of what the threshold is um so they, these must have been pretty low um but the other the other news story i have is is a bit more interesting this comes from tynan's newsletter that he publishes every supposed to be every week but uh, sometimes he misses some uh, i'm just going to read a quote he says uh Things are going to be a little quiet on the Batman front until the end of the year, when I can start talking about what uh, Jimenez and I are building in the Batman title in March, and what Gil and March and I are building in Redacted by DCPR team. Uh, you know, this week sees an aftermath issue to Joker World that starts to set the stage in a new direction we'll take in 2021, uh, the start of an excited new status quo. So there's a new book with Gil and March, presumably, because um, he can't even say the name of the book. Uh, which is very interesting. Uh, and given that it's in this paragraph, it's presumably still Batman related. It may have been a new book. It may just be they're, they're taking over Detective for a while. Maybe. I mean, it could be that as yeah. well. Uh, like it could be yeah. just that Tomasi's going to be leaving that come, you know, March or whatever. And then Titan's would... going to take over Detective for maybe six months while he's done a lot of big stuff with Batman. And then it'll. Kind of what, what the yeah. plan was for Batman in the first place. <laughs> um, you know, take over for six months or whatever and then move on. Well, yeah, but what I'm uh, saying is, is that he's essentially going to have double issues for... Uh, quite possibly. Long, um, yeah. It's hard to say for sure, we don't know. I would tentatively expect to hear about this in the March solicits, given that's when we're expecting you know, things back to normal. Uh, it's close enough that, that he can start teasing things like this, but not too far out that, you know, okay, it's, it's probably set in stone by now. That's it. I'm not actually expecting it to be detective. I'm just saying that's a possibility, because it could very it well is, just yeah. be... I don't know. Batman and Robin is back as a book for a while with him on board or something. Like, yeah, it could, could be. Anything. It's a little disappointing knowing that it's it's Gillamarch on on art again still. Um, but could be worse. Yeah, that 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 is true. Could be worse. That's that's all I see. Could, could be Riley Rosma. Uh, more than that later. So. I, so we don't necessarily do every bit of movie or TV news that pops up DC related uh, because we're a comic book podcast first, but it's sometimes it's worth talking about some of it. And uh, I'll be the judge of that. And I just, I think we have to talk about this in two in two fronts. Now we don't. If, really... if this is the Snyder Cut, I'm not saying a damn word. I've I've said my piece. Well, you can sit there and be quiet while I talk. Okay. So you know we we we. We do know there's going to be reshoots, right? And how much money they're spending on the reshoots and how silly it is because for months and months and years even, we heard that the, that the movie was done. It just had to be released and now it's doing all these reshoots. But the the, the headline this week, there was a couple. There's uh, Deathstroke was coming back for reshoots. Uh, Joe, whatever his face is, who plays him. Um, but the one that really stuck out was Jared Leto <laughs> coming back as the Joker for the Justice League reshoots, which, I mean, <laughs> I, I I can't, like, sum up the failure of DC's movies from the 2010s, right, from, from building the universe, from Zack Snyder's involvement onwards. I can't sum up the failures of the entire shebang better than an, an image of Jared Leto's Joker. It sums up everything for me. Like, the, the whole visual of it, the damage tattoo, uh, his stupid smile, everything about it, trying to be edgy, the, like, it just, everything about it sums everything up. So, him coming back for this, it is, it's just, it's funny, because as much as we kind of compliment the idea that they're, they're kind of starting to just realise they can have a Batman going on with the Matt Reeves stuff, whilst there's maybe other Batman showing up in a Flash movie because they're doing multiverse stuff, while there's a TV show with a different Superman, and then there's another Superman over there, or whatever. Um, it is insane how messy it all is right now, but not because not because of design, or not because they've got different projects they want to do, but just because this movie and all the actors connected to it just won't go away. 
and I don't know. That's just that's just encapsulated that for me this week is that the Gerald Leto, despite the fact that we should never really see him as Joker again, is filming new stuff as the Joker because he's going to be in Zack Snyder's Justice League, which was totally shot and finished ages ago, and these reshoots are just I don't know flexing or whatever. I'm being facetious, of course. It was never a finished cut. And yes, uh, what's his face? Aquaman was lying when he said he saw it. Uh, but that's fine. <laughs> okay, I've, I'm done. No, no I, I, when this was all announced, I said, yeah, I said my piece and said, I'm never talking about it ever again. And I'm, I'm sticking to that. Until we review it, obviously. <laughs> You'll have to pay me a small fortune. That's fine. fine. Matt will be back by then. Matt will review it. Uh, so, there you go. That's that. Uh, that's basically the news. Um, you know, it's a bit of a weird, weird, weird uh, cycle. I mean, I think every month's kind of a weird cycle news-wise, because we have this big week where we get solicits and there's so much to talk about, and then there'll be quieter weeks. But it feels especially weird this month because the solicits had so much, like, juicy stuff about Future State. It was like, oh, all this new things, all these new, this is exciting, yeah, toys. Next month should be, I'm not necessarily saying quieter, uh, you know, because there might be other bits of news scattered throughout. But we're not going to have that big blowout solicits week because no. it's all just going to be the next issues of Future State. Yeah, the, the, the solicits next month should, in theory, be maybe the most boring solicits we've ever had, just purely because in a regular solicits month, there's usually one or two new things in there. Or, or even if it's just, oh, there's a new arc starting. Oh yeah, sure. But with none of that, there'll be literally none of that in the next solicits. Because it'll yeah. all just be issue three and four of this Future State Mini. March solicits uh, come December might hit us like a truck. Come December? We'll get them in December, won't we? Oh, yeah, you're right, you're right. I'm just, I'm doing the math in my head. Uh, <laughs> even January, or even... I, Joe, I'm forget I'm forgetting that Future States was January solicits. I'm thinking that's like November solicits for some reason, even though that makes no sense. <laughs> I'm like, how are you all the way all the way to March already? Because we've got um Endless Winter to, for December. Yes, 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 yes. Um but I, I just uh, I'm ha- it's more of a brain fart about where we are in the year and how many months are left than it is a bit. To, to be else. fair. Do you know what? Normally I give you shit about all sorts of little things, but time perception right now, e- e- even you know long-term time perception on, you know, just what month is it? Yeah, I'll let you off on that one. Um, It's just under four weeks to the PS5. That's that's how I'm counting time right now. It's just over two weeks till I get my Xbox. So, you know, it's closer. Wait a minute, the PS5 is only a week later. How, how are you somehow... It's nine, nine days, and it's two weeks on Tuesday is, is the Xbox. It's two and a half weeks then. It's just over two. It's two and a half. It's just over two. <laughs> How is it just over two? It's two and a half. It's just over two. I'm being, I'm just just, just the, go with it. There's seven days in a week. If you're hitting the third day, it's half the week. If you don't count the Tuesday, and you don't count the Saturday, because that's where we are now. You don't count the Tuesday. How are you not counting the Tuesday? <laughs> you can't just stop counting days. Of course you can. Somehow Saturday and Tuesday don't exist anymore in your, you your don't system. Count, you're not counting Saturday. No, not every Saturday. You're not counting this Saturday because we're already you know, we're oh mostly my. through today. Oh. And the Tuesday that it comes out, you don't count that day because it's there. So the day's in between. One day till Sunday, two days till Monday, three days till Tuesday. I, right? I disagree with the statement that it is one day till Sunday when it is like six hours till Sunday. Ah, oh, oh, shut up! It, the time of day is irrelevant here. Jesus Christ, this is stupid. Look, I don't care. I don't care when you get an Xbox. So, is the is the real point here? The the real point is when I'm getting the PlayStation Five, which is uh, a week later and far more important for numerous reasons, mainly that it affects me and not you, and that makes it instantly more important. So. Look, I mean, I'm just warning everyone. There may be some game console chat sprinkling in throughout the episodes in the next month, just because. Look, there, there may or may not be a point where I convince Pete to sit down and we'll go through games of the generation because it needs to be discussed on a on a, on a very serious level. I'm already doing a top ten of the generation, and you're not invited. 
Well, that's very, very inconsiderate. I don't want to hear your list of top 10 of the generation. The people do, though. Uh, no one wants to hear you talk about Hades for 10 minutes when you get to number one. I'm not going to talk about Hades for 10 minutes. I'll talk about Hades for 12 minutes, thank you very much. And no people love down about. Hades. To be fair, you probably... I mean, I don't know my top 10 off the top of my head. I'd have to say anything about it. But there's at least like three or four games that you'd probably make your list that would be on mine as well. Oh, maybe. So, I've already assembled my top 10. I know what my top 10 you? are. Yeah, the sun That's there. interesting. How many, uh, gen genuine question, just, d d you know, d I'm not going to be spoiling it, but mm -hmm. how much of it is first party games? Um, I'm, I'm just intrigued as to just, uh, that. Oh, I'm thinking. Oh. I think maybe four out of the ten. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah, about four. Yeah. There's at least four, maybe a fifth, but definitely four. Oh, that's pretty good. Why? I was just wondering, just just genuine curiosity on that one is like, you know, because uh, I've, you know, I've seen you know, a handful of people doing different, you know, uh, lists of the generation over the last couple of weeks because it's, it's that time and it's just wild seeing the variety. Some people have like no first party games at all, uh, not by intention, just for whatever reason, they didn't have any. And then others are like, you know, eight, nine of them are first party games. It's uh, just seeing the extremes. Uh, it's interesting to me. Mm. Uh -huh. Um, I don't know, I'm applying that actually. My top ten games of the generation should be up in the relative near future. Um, I'll be honest, I was going to do it yesterday, and I just ended up not having time uh, for a variety of reasons. But uh, that's coming, so you can look forward to that if anyone cares. If anyone is obviously, there's people who listen to this who don't give a shit about video games who are just sitting there begging, please, please move on to the comics. Thank God, this timestamps right. <laughs> Yes, luckily there's timestamps for you, uh, but there's not a lot of books this week, so I'm intentionally having a bit of small talk before we get to the books, okay? That's, that's, the, that's the just <laughs> of that not really much news either, was there? There wasn't, no. It was all, all little tidbit things. So that's just uh, where we are. Um, but I'm jealous, though, because the press have all been getting their PS5 just today, uh, which is good, because it means there'll be previews next week and we'll get some details and whatnot. But About time, right? On the other hand... Uh, I'm jealous. Um, yeah. But I don't really feel about time, though. What do you mean about time? I, I don't mean about about time in that, you know, you're just, because it's close now, you're you're anxious, you're you're wanting information. Not about time that they're, they're intentionally leaving it later than they should be. Uh, that wasn't yeah, the implication that, with that. that Although I think it came, it, it, you could read it as that way, if, 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 the way I said yeah, it. Yeah, it doesn't feel that late to me. I feel no, like, it, it, it's not. I feel like it only feels late because every goddamn gaming podcast I listen to have been constantly complaining that they've not seen the UI yet, and everyone once they saw the UI, it's like, well, we still not actually held the console. Jo jo so what's the next thing? Joe, that doesn't even bother me. It just It's not even that it feels late, because by normal console cycles, this is kind of on par, for at least in terms of when, they, when the press get the hardware. Um, jo other jo things maybe they've been a bit late. No, but... the, the only difference, the only difference this year is that Normally, they wouldn't be complaining that much because a lot of people would have get, got some hands on it during E3 or something similar to that. But because in 2020, there's not been trade shows and there's not been things where they've had it in a box where the journalists can go up and play it months in advance, everyone's anxious. Everyone's like, oh, no, no, no one's seen it yet. It is. That, that's, and, and I'm not anxious and worried about it in that what, sense. What, what if they're all cake? What if it's all cake? <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> When I say about time, I just mean like I want to see some details. I want to, hear. and it doesn't help that Xbox went really early with news. And again, I'm not saying that they, you know, they, you know, they were abnormally early. I'm pretty sure what happened there is all those units were made for E3 and other trade shows. And then when they all got cancelled, they were like, well, we might as well do something with them because yeah. they're all. It's notable that all the ones, all the Xboxes that went out were all like. Uh... Preview the, units. Yeah, there were intentionally, pre whereas the PlayStations that went out are literally the final boxes uh, that are going the, to be Yeah, they're, they're just proper retail hardware, whereas the, the, the Xbox ones have not been. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, it makes sense the Xbox are a bit more aggressive anyway. They're the ones that have to prove something right at this gen. No, they are the ones on the back foot, um, so it makes sense. Yeah. They're coming from the, the, the loss of last time, and... Um, no, it's interesting. I will say it's it's a it's a shame there's no laughing stock this this time because I really enjoyed making fun of Don Matrick last year last generation. I had a lot of fun with that, but hey, yeah, there hasn't really been any no thing. Nah, I, Jim Ryan occasionally says something stupid, but 
it, it, it never affects like the overall policy of what they're doing. Whereas you know, back when Don Matrick was saying stupid things, it was just reinforcing everything everyone hated about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Getting rid of him was the best thing Microsoft ever did. Yeah, the double agent. He was sent to sabotage. I believe it. <laughs> I believe probably it. was. <laughs> What's he doing these days? If I remember correctly, I left Microsoft to go and work at was it was it Zynga or some of that? It was some. I have no idea what that is. Game oh, company. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like a reasonable place for him. Whether or not he ended up staying there or ended up doing something else, I do not know. But uh, yeah, so yeah. very excited though. Let's say you know, just over two weeks and be playing new games, and uh, I'm excited. I'm I'm kind of. I'm in that point now where it's the end of the, you know, the, you know, I, I know the new stuff's coming and, and because all the news is out, I'm in the mood to play and talk about games, but I don't want to burn myself out. So there's like this, this restraint and balancing act going on of like, I don't want to burn out on games before it comes and then have to like, you know, force myself, you know, be like, oh, now I'm like, oh, okay, it's here, but whatever. Um, cause you know, I, I don't know about you, but I, I tend to, I'll play a lot of games for like three months and then I'll what maybe won't touch one for six weeks and you know, i'll kind of go in and out of various phases like that I, i'm very cautious of not wanting to to hit that point right before the new console comes out yeah yeah uh so that's been console watch uh maybe you'll get some more next week um <laughs> thank the thank matt not being there for letting us get away with that for 10 minutes <laughs> to be fair you would have just got some sports talk if matt was here so t- t- choose your poison really Mm, yes. But hey, all right, let's get into the comic books then. Uh, Dark Knight's Death Metal, Robin King, issue one. Riley Rosmo, of course, on art, with Peter G. Tomasi on the main story. It was a backup story with Tony Patrick and Daniel Semper. Um, I, of course, just read this by choice because I am generous and care about the quality of the show and giving the, the audience the an opinion on this big book that came out this week. Uh, Connor was forced to read this via Patreon part. Every month well, of patreon.com slash TV, or the higher tiers, you can make me or Connor read a book. And one such patron decided to make Connor read this. I, I knew you were going to be reading it anyway, so I didn't need to provide coverage for this. The whole point of this show is to have conversations about yeah. the books, where only one of us reads the book, which does happen from time to time because of just tastes or whatever. Um, but that's not the first reason. It's not. It's not like if I didn't read this, you'd be like, you know what? I'm going to take the bullet for the team because I must. No, it's true. And there are books this week that neither of us are reading because proving the point that we're not here to provide a service. We're here to to read the books that we want to read and then have a have a bit of a chit chat about them, and also the books that we're forced to read. Apparently, yes. Uh, so I mean, where to begin with this? Um. Well, I stream. will say, I did not know there was a backup. I, I didn't realize, mm-hmm. I didn't really pay too much attention to the, the credits. I just kind of, just like, all right, fine, I best get through this. So when I got to the point where all of a sudden it ended, and I was like, wait, hang on a second, there's still loads of pages left. And then I turned the page and it was Sampir, who, who I really quite like. That that put me in a good mood. For, oh, for was the, that for a that. nice surprise? It I, was. I, uh... Didn't know there was a backup until I noticed that there was multiple names, and I went, "Oh wait, there's another set of people here. I guess there must be a second story." Uh, I didn't know what the second story was. It, it turns out to be something of a you know, other Robins Bat family, I mean, mainly a Duke story, but with yeah. uh, guest appearances from Tim, Steph, and Cass, which is always nice. Uh, honestly, the main story in this, for the most part, it kind of made me think more of the tales, not tales from Dark. Oh, what were the evil Batman one shots called back when we had metal? I can't remember what they were called, but you know, we we got one. It was a con. Here's, here's the, the 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 speedster Batman's like origin. Here's the Aqua Bat Lady's origin. It, this issue, or the main story at least, for the most part, is that for Robin King, just with a little bit more kind of context in the main present day part of the the crossover. Yeah, as well. Yeah, there was about three pages because it opens with a prologue, which is I, I'm assuming kind of just. The gist of what happened in the the story that was in the other issue before. I mean, not really. It's more the aftermath of it. Okay, fair enough. And then it cuts to then now, and there's like three or four pages where I was like, "Oh shit, is this actually going to be a relevant issue?" And then the rest of it, it was like, "Oh, okay." It's like I said, it's one of those issues. It's one of those Dark Knight issues, and it's 
it's probably the most skippable of all the non-anthology tie-ins we've had so far. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of you know, the, the three that we had last month that all ended up feeling fairly important. This one feels like, if, if you did skip this, you wouldn't be missing much. Yeah, I think it's probably my least favourite. Because uh, I, I like the first two as well, before the last month's, like, three really uh, yeah, necessary ones. Yeah, they were the anthology ones yeah. that we had before, right? And yeah, those were kind of more along the lines of this style of story. Um, but, you know, they were anthology, so, you know, they were a lot shorter stories. I felt like they were adding a lot to the context, and I think that still does a little bit. I, I you know, it may be a little relevant if, 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 the, if the, you know, the planet of Robins <laughs> becomes important or comes up at all in the, the sure. main story. If it even says at the end, continued in Death Metal uh, 5, so uh, it may pop up in there. So I'll, I'll credit this for still feeling like it's part of the, the, the greater event and doesn't just feel like a complete cash grab. Um, Rosmo's art is, of course, polarizing at the best of times. I will say that much like the one or the, the short story in that anthology, th- this is definitely not the worst of his that I've seen of his art. I think partly because his style actually lends itself to the character of the Robin King a little bit. I think he typically looks pretty good in Rosmo's art. Whereas, you know, whenever we see Superman, for example, Superman, you know, a few pages in there looks quite deformed because. There was a, I will say, you know, there were multiple points where I saw Robin King and just for a second, it looked just like a court of owls mask. And I was like, who's this? Who's, who's this wearing an owl mask? And then I realized, oh no, never mind. It's just Robin. Uh, that, that caught me a couple of times. I think it's, it's the way he draws the, the shape of the face with the you know, the very pale and the big eyes. It kind of just reminded me of those masks. Yeah, the gist of this is that the opening sort of sets up just him like building his suit and deciding to be this Robin character. And it even does like a sort of take on the yes, father, I shall become a Robin uh, at the funeral of his parents, which it was a neat enough touch. But once we actually jump ahead, he's essentially going around killing the various superheroes in his world. And he kills Firestorm. Um, he kills what are these two jokers uh, in the planes, uh, Hans von Hammer and Steve Savage. I can't say I'm super familiar with these characters, but uh, Matt probably would have loved them. Matt probably would have been jumping over the moon at the appearance of these two. Uh, so we've got some plane action there. He ends up, you know, beaming Adam Strange, but not with a Zeta beam, with a Eta's beam <laughs> into into a wall. And that's when the Batman Who Laughs shows up. This is him recruiting him, which is, this is the part that made me really think of those one-shots, because a lot of those were, here's this Batman in their world, and then it ends with the Batman Who Laughs showing up and recruiting them. Uh, yeah, this just has another, you know, handful of pages after that. Half the story, probably. I say it's probably like half, because we get uh, what this part of the story that I really liked, because um, there's some stuff in present day with Robin King fighting uh, Blue Beetle, uh, Red Tornado. Animal Man and Red Tornado. And Animal Man, yeah. Uh, and all that stuff was fine. Um, the stuff that I like, though, is the idea that Batman Who Laughs takes this Robin to his world where he's like sort of like basically vetting and like conditioning all the, the Batman that he's collecting. But he's got all these Robins, and we find out that he's making the Robins into these sort of zombies that say crow over and over. He does that by putting them into kind of a, a vat <laughs> of... Uh, yeah, just, oh, a joker, to- a joker toxin. It's like yeah, right? it's a joker toxin and stuff. But he essentially like creates. He, t- he takes whatever robins he finds and turns them into these these zombie robins that he has, for lack of a better word. But Robin King here, as we're just, he's not really, he's not technically the Robin King yet. But just to differentiate, um, he takes this pill that he actually made to deal with Martian Manhunter. His his version of Martian Manhunter. And it actually lets enough of his psyche kind of survive this uh, this process. So that he's saying crow, crow, crow when he comes out. We get this full page layout, which kind of reveals that this is almost this weird, like, toxic cyberpunk factory where he's making these Robins uh, out of people that he's taken from other worlds. But he, he kind of retained a bit of himself, and that's kind of why in the in the main story and then here in this one shot he's kind of regained who he is and his personality uh, not that he's likable or a nice guy by any means he's still this evil little shit but he's not just like a mindless drone that's following whatever the batman who laughs says um and it turns out at the end that him taking that pill in that vat infected the toxins and that every robin who went in after him kind of kept a little bit of themselves 
So the big ending to the story is that the Batman who laughs, so now the Darkest Night, takes him back to the planet, and there's just a bunch of Robins all saying, cheer, cheer, cheer. This is how he is now the Robin King. He's become the King of the Robins uh, all on this planet. So I feel like this army of Robins is going to become relevant probably in some small way at the very least uh, during a fight or something coming up. Uh, quite possibly. Because um, obviously we'd seen some of these Robins before. I think even back to the first metal, they, they had them on the chains, right? Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was always like three of them, though. It was never... This. It was, yeah. Um, we hadn't seen this many before, no. Uh, and I say they they may show up in a in a fight somewhere. Uh, I feel like ultimately when we get to that fight, this will you know when the editor's note says, "Oh, I'll just go see this for the you know the the origin of the the army or whatever." Mm-hmm. Um, that'll feel a lot, you know, a lot less consequential than you know like, like the, oh hey, you should probably check out Trinity Crisis. <laughs> no, no, it probably will be. Uh, I don't think anyone would argue with that, but. Yeah. Uh, it, it still it feels like a decent enough tie in in terms of the the context that it's giving. I I think the I like the probably more than anything I like the story of like what the the Batman who laughs is doing to these Robins to turn them into his Robins. Uh, I like that detail in there. Uh, the rest of it, you know, this Robin like fighting like various heroes, a on his Earth and then in present day in the you know whatever the world we're calling it is now. You know, him taking on Superman and Wonder Woman. Because he's always wanted to kill them. And he never quite got to do it, because the Batman who laughs took him away from his world before he got to Batman, or not Batman, but he got to Superman and Wonder Woman. And so he's really excited about doing it here. And he's kind of disappointed that he's taken away again. Uh, mm. But he, he has now got this army, so... Um, do you know what I, uh, I think would have been a better fit for this story? Um, because I think it's it's very clearly split up into, okay, the the two clearly defined halves of this story, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm not sure it's enough for a one-shot, like a Robin King one-shot. However, what I would have done probably is, along with the one that we had in the other anthology issue, is kind of spread them out over a couple of different anthologies, like split this into two. You know, and you, we've already had two anthologies. I think there is a third one coming up. Uh, it would have been quite easy, I think, to split these over into three anthologies and kind of give each one, you know, uh, you know, split this into two and have that as three stories. Um, might, might have uh, felt a bit tighter that way, perhaps. Mm. Yeah. Or alternatively, um, the the alternative to that I think is take the the backup that was in this, uh, kind of remove that entirely, and take that uh, first story from that uh, the anthology that it was in the the Robin King story, and kind of put that essentially at the start of this and be like, no, this is one big. Robin King issue because if that's what you're, you know, if if you're here for a Robin King story, uh, you know that's what the issue is. I don't think the backup really delivers on that premise at all. Um, feels a little weirdly just included in this issue. Uh, the backup, um, I uh, feel like, you know, structurally, I probably would have swapped that with the other thing in the anthology and, and put the other story in here and had this just be one Robin King story. I don't think you have to swap anything. I mean, I agree that the backup feels like it's just kind of tacked on because it's not relevant to anything else that's going on in this book. That could have easily went into the next anthology book yeah. of some kind. Um, but honestly, the the book as it is is over forty pages, and I think it's a six dollar book. Like you could have easily like the the Robin King on its own. That stuff is still over thirty, so you could have still just char- just made that a sh- shorter book and charge five dollars for it instead of six. Uh, would have maybe yeah. been the solution R- rather than saying, oh, we should have kept back that first Robin King story and so it would still be the same size. Like, I don't think it really matters. It? Sure. I, I think in my head, I was just thinking of either split it up into three separate anthologies or put it all in one book like, as one complete story. It feels a little bit, at least to me, it feels a little bit like you're gouging the audience. Like, hey, we'll, we'll throw in an extra story here so we can justify putting up the price. But if you want the full Robin King story, if, if you're a fan of Robin King or, you know, you've got a get the other anthology as well. Like, it just feels like a a lot of, of just strange choices to me. That last part feels like a really weird logic thing to say. Like, what, what, <laughs> like the whole point of having the, the, that first story in the other anthology is to... Well, maybe not the whole point, but the idea being that the reason why I wouldn't include it in this as one big one-shot is that that short story, in theory, is what's supposed to make some people go, hey, I kind of like that short story, and then they see a one-shot coming out, oh, I want more of that character, so I'll go buy this this overpriced one-shot that'll give me the, his story. Um, 
the backup in this feeling tacked on, I completely agree with. No, but I, I just I get where you're coming from. So with that no, but, as well. no, but the part thing you said there that sounds really weird to me is that oh, if you're a Robin King fan, then you have to go back and buy this other anthology. But if you're a Robin King fan, then surely you're only a Robin King fan because he's only appeared in one thing before this. It was that anthology story. No, he was he was in the main book. He was chasing the flashes, right? Okay. Oh yeah, he he appeared briefly. But so if if you like that, and then you're told, hey. You know, if if you if you enjoyed that, and then you're told, hey, uh, Tomasian and, and and Rosmo are doing a a Robin King one shot. Here you go. Uh, you know, because that obviously this comes after that that uh, element of the main book. You might go, oh, I'm interested in that. That that's probably enough for most. Yeah, people, but it feels weird to me to say they're gouging because there's already a story that happened before. Like it's not. <laughs> that's weird to me. That's like saying I don't know. Um, Oh, you like this movie? Oh, do, do you know that it happened to be? There was another one before. I know it's bullshit. You have to go back and buy that other movie I, now. I think, but there's already I one think, there. I think the, the 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 problem is conceptually to me, it feels like they were conceived at the same time. We know for a fact this Robin King one shot was in the works a long time before they announced it. You know, Snyder put it on his big board uh, near the start of Mel. Um, it feels like that they could have just made this into one big story rather than chopping it up like that to me it just feels strange as a choice i don't understand how this is any different than say them like having a couple of teases of punchline before they have the issue where we really get punchline story like, I, don't, I don't really see how it's any different than that like by having an appearance early on with a bit of the story that, that gauges interest and gets people wanting to buy the next thing with them in it um and if they don't like it and they don't care then that's fine they don't have to but you know, basically, you got a taste of what Robin King's story on his own would be in an anthology book that maybe you you justified buying because hey, it's got seven eight stories. Some of these sure. characters I like. It's a bit of a pick and mix. It's a bit of a buffet. You get to try all these different things. And if you like this one in particular, oh hey, there's a one shot coming just for you. It's coming mm. out in a month or two's time, and it's got got all this extra stuff. Um. So the logic of saying <laughs> you read this, oh, I'm a Robin King fan. Wait, I have to go back and get an anthology to get the whole Robin King story. It's just like it's a weird. It's like you're actually thinking about it back to front, just so there's something to complain about. It's so no, weird. I, I think uh, fundamentally, what it comes down to is, the, and the reason why I'm thinking this way is, I don't feel like this was enough to justify the the, the page count uh, ultimately. Uh, and and you know, maybe if you take the back out and bring the page and price down. I wouldn't be thinking this way, but as it is, I'm trying to justify. Okay, how do we have it at this price point, this page count, and and well, okay, wait, but why why are you trying to justify it at this this price and page because count? Because I guess in my head, that's the price they're selling it at. That's where they've determined they are damn sure they're selling Robin King at this price. That's why they've thrown in the random backup. I'm trying to find a way to make that more appealing as a Robin King book. Or we just fix it the way that's the obvious fix is you take out the backup and lower no, the no, price. No, that, that works too. I don't, I don't see why you're insisting you're trying to justify because the I'm price. Because I'm assuming there is, like, this is the thing, <laughs> I'm assuming there is a business mandate that says, no, you are selling these tie-ins at this page count, this price. We will not allow you to do lower. And that is my assumption here, that that's why there's this arbitrary story thrown in to hit that count. And at that point, I'm, I'm thinking, well, they should have thought this through better. That's, that's my logic here. Okay. I, I, I do agree <laughs> fundamentally just lowering the page count, lowering the price is a much simpler and cleaner and better solution to this problem. Again, I'm just working on the assumption there is a business mandate Matt, that they can't do that. Well, I mean, you're saying business mandate, but it may not be done in that order. The, the reason why that second story might be here, it may just be that they wrote one too many stories for the next anthology and went, shit, we have to put this somewhere. Tack it on to one of the shorter tie-in books that we can bump up Possibly, to six dollars yeah. like it, it could be that way around and at that point it's like well they're going to put it somewhere <laughs> i mean it, does it make more sense here compared to like one of last month's books i mean there would have been even yes. more tacked on in those ones uh, i mean okay last month's ones uh, i've been the month before uh, i think ultimately the, the the story at the end feels like it belongs in one of those other anthologies right that we had before not in those though, because I, I think the the timeline here specifically is meant to be set where we are in the main story. I think because even the Robin King uh, story sure. yeah. is as well. So I, I will compliment that. It does kind of feel like they've made that conscious effort so that all the tie-ins when we read them are actually set where we are in the main story and between those issues or during roughly those issues. I will give it that some good editorial work going on there. 
So that is really neat. Um, I will yeah. agree that what you know the, the backup story, like really, you could have just bumped that. But the thing is, though, let's say the next anthology is like a big eighty-page one. Did they really want to add in another ten pages and get to ninety? You know, is it starting to be a bit too unwieldy at that point? Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, the main story though, I think is fine. It's, I, I think there's some nice details in there. Um, and they are. Well, I'm not a big fan of Rosmo stuff. I think it's less egregious here. And I said this in the last story, Robin King. It, it, it kind of fits the the manic kind of like evil little shit that he is um it, it obviously it feels a bit when he's doing other characters but for the most part it didn't bother me as much compared to say when i tried reading his martian manhunter or, or some of his other anthology entries that, that have popped up in other books that that's definitely worse stuff i think um a problem i did have um beyond just the usual i don't like his style faces whatever is i did actually struggle with the flow of one of the fights. I think it was when Red Tornado was going. Um, I think it's the way he uses Red Tornado and in his style, and it felt kind of just messy on the page to me, and I didn't quite get the the flow of the fight because of it. Uh, and, and that was a, a you know a, an actual storytelling problem I, I had. Sure, which, sure. Uh, I, I will say usually it's just a stylistic problem I have with him. If I, if I had to, I would say I actively kind of like his art. See, see in the the section where Robin's been put in the pit, and then he comes out. I actually think that, especially with the colors, with all the greens and uh, mm. sort of light blues, I actually think those few pages look really good, and they actually really fit the sort of feeling that it's going for. Um, so clearly, I think there is a style of story that Rosmo, and again, he is a bit more restrained in the sense that he's not doing those big bulging heads in these pages where he could ruin it if he did that. <laughs> like it, it would actually take it out yeah. of the scene, but. Yeah, you know, it's you know, it's it's yeah. As as far as the story itself goes, though, I I think it's a a decent, if if maybe the the least uh, spectacular or necessary out of all the tie-ins so far. Um, if if this ends up being the weakest one, if this ends up being the one that's the bottom of the pile by the time we're done, because it is right now, then I think we've actually had a really good event. Because t- typically speaking, there'll usually be at least a few that are just worthless shit. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there's usually only really one or two that's worth reading, let's be honest. So, that's interesting. Uh, the backup, though, when we get to Sam Pierre here at the end, um, it's basically Duke's fighting this uh, this Bruce who... At first I was thinking, like, Batman Atomic Skull in the first that couple of pages. That was my first assumption yeah. as well. Uh, it turns out it's actually Batman and Ra's al Ghul, but they fell in a Lazarus pit and fused together or something like silly like that. <laughs> Yeah, this is very comic booky, isn't it? This is really silly. I mean, don't get me wrong. I I love Steph, Cass, and and Tim all being there to help. Oh, and it, it's Duke as well. Is part of them. Duke, well, Duke was in the Lazarus Pit with them as well. Oh, yeah, on that Earth, you mean? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, but like, it does focus on Duke. Duke's the main sort of narrative voice we have. He's the narrator. Um, I kind of liked him feeling more like a part of the Bat family. I think him just interacting with these other legacy Bat characters instantly make him feel more like he's part of that group and kind of establish him. And I have to say, I actually really like the effect uh, in the art where he kind of just goes into like a yellow silhouette to kick. You know, so he's using his light powers to become kind of translucent. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. he, and he kicks the, uh, the, 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 the Razbat ghoul. Um, and yeah, I like that page. I like this idea of like using that as a... It, it almost kind of feels like a... I think it's something to compare it to. Like it, it almost feels like a, some sort of like comic book thing. And this is like a weird thing, but you know, like a movie where they'll do like a if they're doing something really stylized, they'll switch to like a sort of like simple comic book page for like the middle of a punch, right? That feels like how you do that in a comic book is you just have them go into a solid color kind of thing. Oh sure, okay, I know what you're getting at. All right, I don't know, it's very hard, but you know, I like the final page with them all swinging together and okay, we've we've. Save this neighborhood, time to get to the next one. And it's the idea that they're just like going around the narrows and, and Gotham and trying to uh keep some sort of control and save people while this is all going on. Um Yeah. I think so. what I'll say about this story is it's not bad. It's just not really a story. There's not much to it. No, it's just Duke and this guy fight. Him explaining like how he was created. Um and Duke sort of like regaining control of his powers, the others helping and that's it. They're off to save someone else. Uh, it's, it's very much just here's a small pocket of the world right now with, with characters that we've not really been 
you know, paying attention to. What's so funny is that there's been a decent amount of tension between Batman and the Outsiders and Batman on some of these characters that I don't actually feel like they're as neglected as they usually are, <laughs> but... Yeah, I'd say that would not... probably be the, the follow-up to this, is it felt weird that there was no specific interaction between Duke and Cass, really, given their recent history. Um... Well, the point I was trying to make there uh, was that they, they're not people, characters that we've seen in this death metal story. Uh, so they do actually feel like, oh, hey, we've not actually seen them in the context of this story. That's what I was trying to say. Um, as far as the Cass and Duke, though, um, I don't think it's missing from this. In fact, the fact that she's the first one who jumps out, because he just sort of yells out Cass, you know, left shoulder or whatever, and she jumps out of the, the portal that he makes for her. Um, I, I felt like that was kind of like... I got excited because it was Cass, because, oh, Duke and Cass mm. have got a camaraderie. And then Tim and Steph showed up as well. So, oh, hey, the whole team's here. Cool. Um, yep. But the fact that Cass showed up first, it made it feel like that was the acknowledgement that they have, you know, a bond, because like, there's a connection between them now. Um, Fair enough. There's not much in the story, though, to really like have anyone bond more than that, though. So I, I didn't really... No, I just it, I don't even think they kind of... She, she says just hi, and then... Uh, not not to Duke, either, to the to the bat, as, as she pops out. I don't think they have an actual line of dialogue exchange between them. Like, you know, the, the others do. And, and, and I know she's obviously quiet, she doesn't say as much. But it felt weird that there was no, you know, he didn't a- actively acknowledge her at any point after that. It just it just felt a little bit missing to me. Um, I can't say I agree. I, I don't know. I really don't know what you're getting at, to be honest. Uh, it, 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 there's no room for it. It's just kind of a quick little fight scene, really. Ultimately, I, I don't know. It doesn't feel like it's lacking to me. Um, it's one of these things where the context of where I know they 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 two are right now added to her jumping out first. But I don't think that anything's missing here because they don't have a moment in this short story, which is really weird to me that you're even the one bringing this up because you've not even read Outsiders. No, I, I know, and I'm not saying they need a big moment, but it, it just felt weird with the, the conversation at the end where the, there's a bit of back and forth between the other three, uh, like, or, you know, more specifically, Duke and then Steph and then Tim, you know, there's, they've kind of, you know, a little bit of back and forth, and there is absolutely nothing. Like, Cass, you can't even see on these pages. Uh, she's in the silhouette. You can see her in the silhouette in, in one panel at that top, in the, in the conversation part of the page. And then the rest of it's just, uh, you know, the other three of them. So it just it just, it felt missing to me not having some line of dialogue in this conversation you know or just feeling like she was part of the group in that conversation to me felt missing yeah i can't say i see it so that's uh the backup story um as far as far i mean as far as the book goes uh, it is probably the most skippable of all of these tie-ins so far i don't regret reading it though there was definitely some interesting beats in there that i i kind of liked and you know, I'm always down for more Steph and Cass than anything, really, even though they're relatively minor in, in the backup story. Um, but it's okay. I don't think it's a bad issue. It's, it's not a great issue, but it's not bad. What are you giving it? I'm going to give it a four. I mean, I, I, I didn't really care for the story as much as you did. I had oh. some structural issues. I didn't like the art in that. Uh the backup felt superfluous. So it's, it's hard for me to give it, you know, if five is what I consider to be an average, like, you know, this is just a bog standard, you know, it, it's okay, uh, then then it's below that for me. But it's not like the worst thing ever, which is why it's not lower than a four. It was a fine read. Obviously not perfect by any means. I'm happy to give this a six. Happy to give it a six. Uh, but hey, the degrader strikes again. Um, so, where are we? Batman 101. Class is in session. Open your books. We'll be studying the art of Batmaning today. So yeah, what do we have here? We have Titan in the Fourth, uh, writing with Gillum March on art. Uh, with parts of this not looking as Gillum March as normal. Not necessarily much better, admittedly. But there's definitely some stuff early on where he's doing like some flashback pages where it doesn't look like he's like he's typically he's trying to be as clean as possible, it looks like. Right? A lot less lanes. It still has the it still has the proportions of Gilmar yeah, Char. I'm gonna say, you know, veins popping out of necks and, and such. Uh, yeah, like it felt 
marchy to me. Also, I have a just on what we're talking about, you know, Gil and March things. When did Batman get the shoulder pads again? Is is that new? Like all all of a sudden he's got the uh, like the very nineties, you know, shoulder spikes. This issue, he got them. This issue, like, like it seems like a weird choice to just bring those back all of a sudden. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. This issue is basically Batman talking to Catwoman and deciding what they have to do going forward, uh, or what he wants to do going forward. He needs to like basically buckle down and like sort of get used to the idea of not being a billionaire Batman <laughs> because uh, when he goes to see Lucius, as we find out in the uh, sort of the week flashback, is that. There's a lot of scrutiny because of Bruce Wayne's money ending its way up to Joker, and even though he was tricked, uh, the idea that the, the company's going to look weak, there's going to be a lot of eyes on him, but if Lucius keeps the money, and when Enterprise tries to operate without him as kind of its public figurehead, with Batman kind of taking more of a backseat to everything, that he'll be able to operate as Batman, but he can't, like, if they're going to be looking closely at the financials of the company, they can't be having secret, you know, warehouses and factories underneath Gotham that are producing Batmobiles left and right. They can't have, like, satellite scanners and all sorts of weird shit. He has to be a bit more sort of grounded, a bit more down to earth. And, uh, and Batman talks to Selina about how Joker was right, like, something has to change. Like, you know, regardless of how crazy he is, things weren't working. And things do have to, you know, Gotham has to change, Batman has to change to kind of adapt to that Gotham. Uh, so, yeah. There's a whole fight scene with Grifter, because Grifter's now Lucius's bodyguard, because uh, Lucius is uh, scared because of everything that happened to him. Yeah, sure. Why not? Uh, feels like, hey, you know, Grifter fans, here's something for you, right? Yeah. Uh, and then you have uh, Punchline on TV, kind of still saying what she is. There's yeah, because Lucius makes a point of saying that he almost bought a company that was selling a like a, a pro punchline free, t-shirt. Free punchline. Yes. Uh, this idea is a kind of a political movement and people are starting to back her and, you know, how distressing that is. And he talks about Clown Hunter and all the rest of it. Um, yeah, this was very much a setup issue. It was very much a quieter setup issue, which I think is important. I think it was the right thing this issue should be after issue 100, after everything we just went through. This yeah, had it was to be much a- an- epilogue to that as it was a setup going forward yeah it has to be this you know it says something that lucius is going to bring in his family to help one of the run run win enterprises i'm trying to say and you know um it does tease something though uh, batman when he's leaving uh lucius's place he turns to grifter because grifter's trying to like, make it all nice like ah, oh, i was just sparring you know the, the fight is whatever blah blah uh and he says tell your boss i know what halo is uh and the the clear implication here is a boss other than Lucius, right? Oh, of course, yeah. It's not it's not Lucius, of course. It's uh it's someone else. Um, and he says that he's watching and he's paying attention to to whatever this Halo thing is. Now we've not heard this mentioned yet, right? This is completely new to us. I believe so. Yeah. So you know, it's a uh, an interesting tease for something coming down. I wonder if this is you know post Clown Hunter post. Uh, Silver Ghost, or not Silver Ghost Two, whoever that new villain is. Yeah, Ghost. I know the one you're on about. Yeah, the one that was just you know the one that was teasing Ghost, the Ghost Maker, something like that. Ghost. There's a lot of really generic names that sound a lot like this new villain, so it's take, is, yeah. taking a bit of time to get used to it. Uh, I will say though that page where he says that to Grifter and flies off, I won't say that I like the art in it because it's still got the Gillen March face. Uh, but I do kind of like the. Like the bottom half of it, the the concept of that, where he's kind of like, uh, you know, he's grappling away and there's lightning in the sky and Grifter's on the roof looking down at him. Um, I, I think it's probably more the colouring and anything that I like, but it's just there. Uh, no, I agree. The, the the green is an interesting choice, right? Yeah, it's got that sort of greeny, almost aqua colour. Yeah, uh, it's not your traditional lightning bolt sort of colour that, you, that you'd usually see on these pages. It makes it stand out a little bit more. I, I do think it is a colouring choice here that, that makes it interesting. Yeah. So, and it's it's kind of all inside of like Batman's cape from the, the top half of the page as well, uh, which gives it an interesting kind of, you know, break up from the, from the top half. Mm. Interesting enough layout. Um, I think let's maybe... Something I'm enjoying here, although I will point out that there's a, at least one gratuitous uh, ass shot in Catwoman here towards the end of the book. Uh, uh, for for 
no reason other than just we framed it this way where it's her ass in the foreground as she's talking to Batman. Um, uh, I think there's at least two I can think of. Is there a second one? I don't remember a second one, but uh, there's one in particular. Uh, yeah. It's just it's two pages after the uh, him coming off the roof. But they're basically, what I liked about this is they're, they're, they're talking about, like, okay, you have to, like, rebuild Gotham and you're about to tell me that we can't be a thing in that time. You have to stay focused. And she essentially says, look, I'll give you a year, right? Or he says to her, I'll give me a year. I don't know who brings it up first, but they basically say that in a year we'll come back and we'll actually figure out a way in how we're going to work as a couple. And I think it's interesting to me that Tynan didn't just drop the idea of them trying to be in an active functioning relationship. Because it's something that I kind of expected after King's Run, whoever was going to take the book was just going to be like, Ah, uh, Catwoman kind of back to the status quo. She's kind of an ally, but kind of not. And we're going to forget yeah, about the marriage. I mean, that that would have been the worst case scenario for sure. This doesn't feel like that much better to me. Like for, to me, exploring that is what was exciting about the outcome of this stuff. And now it's like, well, maybe in a year. Like, oh God damn it! It's going to be so long till we see this stuff. I, I'm, I'm that's the stuff I'm interested in seeing in in the main book and in, in the, the present day. Like, I know we're going to get the the back cap book that will have a lot of their relationship but i want to see you know in the here and now present day continuity how does it work and this kind of feels an easy out almost for the time being it is but i mean the fact that they're actually putting this timer on it does this not like say to you that tainan does have a plan uh, whatever it may be i mean maybe the plan isn't that satisfying we don't know but does it not say that he does plan on doing something after he's went through a few more arcs? I, I would say uh, it's it's very possible that he does, uh, and I'm not you know going to say that absolutely he does not have a plan. I would not dare to presume that. If anything, I would say but, that this is more about letting her go off into her own book and not having to worry about it matching up with what Batman's doing. Quite possibly, uh, and maybe it's from editorial doing that. And um, I would say to me, it, this didn't you know it it didn't feel inherently like Tynan having a plan. It felt more the opposite to me in that, uh, you know, he kind of got put on this book extended, you know, last minute of, oh, hey, we need you to stay on and do some more stories. A year in comic time does not translate to a year of, in, in our world, a year of stories. So we could still be, you know, two years down the line and, oh, hey, you know, I guess that year's finally up. It feels to me potentially like Tynan's putting this hey, I don't need to worry about this in my run. I can leave it for the next writer to, to take up. Uh, potentially. I'm not saying that's what he's doing. Wait, I mean, it could be a year in real time. It could not be. It tends to actually go back and forth on that stuff. It, it does. Uh, yeah. New 52, notoriously, I think, was actually supposed to be about. I think it was, but that's... New 52 and then Vertigo stuff tend to be the exception to the rule uh, rather than, you know, uh, this... A year here, I, I don't take that to mean a no, year. No, I was going to say yeah. the opposite. New 52 was only maybe like a year in real time. Or was it? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I remember towards the end, like someone referenced something. I, th I think it was uh, Supergirl referenced like landing like only like 10 months ago on Earth that it was like, wait, what? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so I, I I remember being surprised by that at the end, the end of that. But, um, but sometimes it, it seems to go back and forth where sometimes you feel like, yes, it's very decompressed. So like, five years in the real world is like one year in comic book time but then sometimes when they say a year in the comics they're actually saying that because they mean it they mean like in a year we're going to get get to something no i'm not saying that is here and when i say do you think he has a plan i don't necessarily think he actually when i say he has a plan i'm more just saying that he plans to do something with it not that he has an actual plan mapped out for this is exactly what he's going to do Let when he gets to it. i think that is it's it's very possible that you are right here and uh, that's why i don't want to like come down like i'm you know, you're, you know i'm not arguing that you're wrong but that wasn't my gut instinct. My first thought when I read this was, oh, it's a year. He can kind of shove that off to the side and uh, that can be the next writer's problem. It was was how it came across to me. That's not to say that that's what will happen. though. Yeah, I, I think the fact that they're even talking about it and addressing that that's still a part of continuity is a little commendable because I, I'm so used to new writers and new runs just kind of ignoring whatever came before as best as they can. This felt... Them actually saying that they're still actively trying... Because maybe the reason why it surprised me a little bit is because while she's been there and she's been a part of Joker War and she was obviously still playing in characters to what we knew her as from before, I never really felt like it was really talking about them as a couple or talking about... It almost felt like, okay, we're keeping where their characters were 
at the end of that run without actually really talking about why they were that way or if there's any going to be any so it almost felt like it was in limbo almost like okay they're kind of stuck in this state and are we advancing beyond that them actually talking about it here and even though they never actually mentioned the wedding itself them actually talking about well we're still trying to somehow figure out what we are and what we are going forward that feels like to me it's acknowledging the wedding without actually talking about it directly and saying you know saying the word wedding or saying the word marriage it feels like no we almost did that thing it didn't happen it's, it's but we still possible, want yeah. something we still clearly both want to be a part of each other's lives so them even talking about it, it said something to me about the characters here that's been missing up until this point Sure. Yeah, uh, I, I get where you're coming from for sure. Uh, by the way, I just went to the last page, just you know, flicking through, and it does say next enter Ghost Maker. So oh, Ghost Maker. There you go. Um, but uh, I think going forward, uh, just in the short term, the Catwoman thing is the only thing I really dislike. Uh, at least you know, in in the short term, that's what I was looking forward to. The idea of okay, we're doing a bit of a lo-fi Batman, as he says himself, is. Uh, fun to me. Uh, the, okay, he's he's going to be living in an apartment in the city rather than in the mansion. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we've done this before, but I'm 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 down for it. I think it'd, it'd be refreshing, and I think it's going to be fun to see Tynan tackle this because, and and he said it himself, his aim when he came on the book was every issue. I want a new gadget. I want a new car. I want a new something. Uh, you know, he wants to be over the top, and him now giving himself this limitation going forward is going to be interesting to see what he does. I think it's good, because while it was funny that he kept finding new things to put in, it's not necessarily my favourite thing to do with Batman, is to say, oh, he's got an endless list of new things that... No, it's it's not my favourite element either, but I, I get that he was just having fun with it, um, and I can appreciate that. I also, I wonder, just in a cynical sense here, I wonder if this new sort of more down-to-earth Batman is kind of like, not completely, but like... It's a little bit closer to the next movie version of Batman, and that he's going to be this, you know, down and dirty, you know, just fixing out his own car with his own homemade gadgets. Like, it's not going to be exactly that lo-fi. I'm, I'm sure he's still working with a lot of the tech that he had lying around and whatnot, but... Um, yeah, no, I get where you're coming from. There's a line where Lucia says, you know, if you break a car, you have to fix it yourself. Yeah, um, so I just, I wonder if that's like a conscious effort so that by the time that movie comes out, which is still, you know, quite, you know, it's like two years almost still, because they pushed it back. Like, I just wonder if they want, you know, anyone who ch ch checks out recent stories of Batman by the time we get there, if like, oh, the Batman there is not too unrecognizable to anyone who's watched the new movie. It's, it's possible. In the past, DC haven't been terribly conscientious about having things line up uh, in that way. Which but is, may maybe, maybe this is something that they should be doing. I think I like it in this case if they are doing this because it's not that much. It's not, you know, it's not. I, I think if they changed his outfit to look more like the movie outfit and all of a sudden, like, certain characters, like, you know, the penguin started looking like Corin Fowl's peng penguin, it would start to feel really weird and forced and whatever. I think this is a case where you're just taking one kind of key idea and you're just kind of, like, establishing that into our, still our current Batman, you know, continuity. You can still have that kind of grungy style of Batman that we've had before in the past in Batman comics. Yeah. It's it doesn't feel weird to be doing it again because like I say, oh it's oh that's a, a take on Batman that we've gone back and forth on over the years, but maybe doing it now while that's kind of in the zeitgeist is maybe it, a smart thing to do. Maybe you're right. It's kinda of like just having Maxwell Lord around in Wonder Woman when the new movie's supposed to be out. Yeah, they're not doing the same story of whatever's going on in that movie, yeah. I assume. Uh, I mean, obviously we haven't seen it, so it can't be 100% I highly, certain, I highly but... doubt liar, liar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, I, I agree. You know, it can't be 100% certain, but I'm pretty confident it's not that story. Um, but just more, okay, there'll be, re you know, be recognisable characters if if someone should go and pick up a trade. And, and this is not there'll be recognisable characters, but it'll be a recognisable style. Yeah, so... Yeah, it's uh, some interesting things. So, you know, they end in this flirtatious moment where they're going to go to his new apartment and uh, have sex. <laughs> That's basically what she says at the end. Yeah. Um, but, no, I like that it's a downbeat issue. I like that it is just sort of establishing kind of the, what the new status quo is going to be. It really kind of feels like, well, he might have held some Joker stuff back from Joker War because he, he was expecting a shorter run. I do kind of feel like this new status quo of like, let's, go down, let's go back down to Earth, move into the city, sort of stop relying on trying to fill Alfred's role with someone else and just deal with the fact that I don't have an Alfred anymore. I feel like this part of the run is probably the new stuff, the stuff that he didn't initially come up with. This is like, okay, this is the, the new 
maybe even the longer part of the run because now it's like well how long is this run going now so and, and this will be where we find out truly what what tan's like as a writer you know where i'm sure he he played you know loose on other books in the past but this is here where he had a story he had an in and out and then they were like we need more and this is where we can see what he can come up with more or less off the cuff like okay just right you need to write batman stories for the next year what have you got and then okay th this will be you know kind of make or break of, as, of his talent for me if he can pull this off i'll you know be like, okay going forward i'll have a lot more faith in what he can do even though i'm already a fan uh if that makes sense i think it's pretty safe to say that he's going to be on the book for a while given that he's starting some big arc in march which is apparently going to have a second book involved in some capacity so you know clearly and at the very least i expect him to be on until uh, what uh, about september or october next yeah. year is when i expect and, it to at least go till now and bear in mind it's double shipping still as well plus potentially another book um that's uh it's a lot of issues still to come right yeah so there you go uh what are you giving this issue about man i'm gonna give it a seven i think it's perfectly solid um it doesn't go above and beyond it's what it needed to be in the uh you know, the the quieter downbeat uh, issue i think though some of the art holds it back from some of those quieter moments feeling like it, it should and you know just kind of i think the, the the grifter fight holds it back a little bit as well and like oh we needed the six pages of fighting in our issue in our batman issue where it, i don't think we really needed it that's fair um i'll probably agree with the seven i think I really like everything it's setting up. I'm loving the idea of the, the more back-to-basics approach. Uh, I kind of agree with the Grifter fight, even though... I do, I do, I did enjoy the tease moment, where they're teasing something connected to mm, Grifter. No, 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 that, that was a nice moment. And I did... Uh, and, you know, I'm just generally enjoying what they're, where they're going with everything. And I enjoy, I enjoy the seeding of the punchline stuff ongoing in the background. I like that kind of world-building. Uh, obviously the art is the big thing for me that really takes it down a, a, a couple of notches um you know like if that, if this had even just a, a decent artist that i liked <laughs> it would probably be up a whole point at the very least and maybe even higher if it was a really good artist so um yeah seven out of ten for me too so uh, justice league issue 55 joshua wilmson writing with robson roca on the art and not as a manico i will i want to give credit to roca though because i think there's a really big effort here made to try and match what it felt like what the art was the style was and how it looks and it felt like the transition was smooth even if you can tell it's a different artist it feels like a smooth transition to me i think um i don't know if it's different inca maybe um because it's uh it's not bad like right? you know don't get me wrong uh We've praised Roker on various books, you know, over the past few years, and I do think he is making an effort here to, you know, kind of play in the wheelhouse of what Zamanica was doing. I still like felt it. I think the inks are a bit heavier, maybe, or a, a bit looser as well. Um, so I kind of just I felt it a little bit, like a few pages in. I don't think I looked at the credits page. I was a few pages in, and I was like, this just doesn't feel the same. And then when I went back and looked, I was like, that's that's why. Um, so I didn't notice, but it's not the worst art by, by a long shot. Hmm. Uh, we left off the last issue with the various team members hallucinating because of the Starro field. <laughs> For context, yes. check out the last issue. Uh, but Lex and Nightwing uh, were snapped out of it. Lex, because he's built up immunity to Starro because he's been dealing with Starro telepathy for a, a long time. Because Luther. Um, Nightwing, I, I don't necessarily like them using the whole brain injury as a plot Please device. Please forget about it. Just because I'd like to forget anything to do with it uh, forever, thank you very much. But, whatever, Nightwing's okay too. Um, Lex tinkers with Cyborg's uh, cannon, which helps snap, snap everyone out of it. Um, with a Vertigo, of all things. So, you know, it's a, it's a random thing to just use here to solve it, but at least it's something that is established in the DCU. I mean, it's not established at helping with this spe specifically, but interesting. Yeah, it'll do, right? Um, I, I like the idea as well that they're, they're confused because it's like, hey, look, I know how Starra works. There's got to be some sort of physical connection uh, for, for this to work like this. And then it turns out there's just microscopic ones that they've been breathing in. 
and they're like they're attached like the inside of their lungs and such. I thought that was a kind of cool idea. Mm. Um. So yeah, and we get the idea that the the entire beach or field that they're on is actually one giant starro, uh, which eventually starts to rise, and they're having to run off of them and all that. Um. Lex reveals that he's got a ship which he's named Lana. Yeah. After yep. his mother, so that's, that's sweet, I guess. Uh, is it just <laughs> sure. me, is it just me or uh, is that the metal men that are? Yeah, at first I thought it was like steel or something, but then I saw oh, there's like three of them, so yeah. it must be metal men, right? Yes. Um, yeah, because I think even the figurehead <laughs> is gold, right? Uh, it's hard to so. tell because you can't quite make out the face, but it's kind of what? body shaped at the front, right? Well, the question I have is where the fifth thing, because we, we got the the three uh, mass, and we got we got the, the front of the ship is the gold, but where's whatever one's missing? Maybe Mercury that's missing. Could be the ship itself. Oh, well, the ship was wooden to me, but I mean, maybe if you t- if you tell me it's a brownish metal, I'll I'll buy it. Yeah, okay. but. No, I mean, uh, that, that's kind of my best guess. I can't see where it is either. But they're not happy working with Lex, of course, but they have to go off and try and save Martian Manhunter and the Legion of Doom so they can take on uh, Perpetua, Weakener, and, of course, uh, get past the Omega Knight, which, of course, we get to see again in this issue, and is glorious. But we have Beth... Big cliffhanger. Uh, in fact, probably my favorite page of the whole book is the, the two-page spread with the, the Omega Knight looking down on them. They realize that they're... Because they're trying to sneak in. Lex is trying to use Nightwing's stealth abilities to, to get around. Unfortunately, though, the 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 Mind Hunter, the, the Batman, you know, Martian Manhunter, the evil one, he has essentially stolen uh, Martian Manhunter's mind and lures in Kendra. And with that, has figured out that they're all coming. So they, they all know, they know they're there. The Omega Knight attacks them in the final page. The cliffhanger is the Omega Knight blasting the team uh, with and, uh, uh, an energy beam. So it, Even Lex is going, yeah, we're doomed. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, if this was anything else, like if, if this wasn't a cliffhanger, which I know they're going to somehow resolve in a way that they're all okay, that last page would look like they're all being killed. <laughs> Quite frankly. I think what's interesting is because we're still in the, the Metalverse and things need to be reset anyway, mm-hmm. it's kind of possible they are killed. I would, well, yeah, but it's like all the main team though, right? Like everyone. Right, And but I think what I'm going to refer back to is a little bit earlier in the issue, Chimp is in a bad place mm. when they grab him because uh, he's not snapped out because he's not with the rest of the group. So he's not snapped out straight away. And uh, he's he's kind of annoyed at them. He's like, "No, I, you know, you should have just left me. I was in a happy place. I was I was in." They're like, "Well, it's not. It wasn't real." He's like, "Yeah, well, this place isn't really real either. You know, we all kind of know that." And they're like, "Look, you know, we gotta go. We do what we can. We're the Justice League." And he's like, no, "No, no, no, we're not the Justice League. We're the Suicide Squad." And that almost might have been a really smart bit of foreshadowing at, for this ending here. Of no, they are the Suicide Squad. They're all gone, and there's kind of a new team next issue. That would be a ballsy as hell move. It would be. It would definitely be a, a a brave move to start next issue with maybe because Detective Chimps left back on the on the boat. He doesn't come with them. Yeah. So it'd be a definitely an interesting move to start the next issue with no no Lex, Nightwing, Starfire, Cyborg, they're all dead. And Chimps on his own and he finds maybe someone else to help him. Uh but maybe he becomes more brave because he needs to I don't know, like, there's there's maybe directions you can go there if that's the case. Yeah. I will say, though, I, I don't know if I expect it, just in the sense that I'm enjoying this, this tie-in arc well enough, but it, the pacing of it has not been super like quick. It, it does feel like it's maybe a little bit of a stalling arc, in the sense that the characters are moving at kind of a, a relatively slow pace. It feels like, you know, the story of these three issues could have been done probably in two. Like, there's definitely a, a, a lot of smaller beats in between things, and while I, I like smaller beats for a lot of these things, it didn't kind of feel like, you know, when I read issue two and then this this third issue here, it, you know, a lot of it felt like, okay, like, we're still traveling to get there. We're still, you know, I feel like we set up that we have to get to these characters. We have to get to Martian Manhunter in issue, the first issue of this arc. And we're in issue three and we're only just kind of getting there now at the end of this issue. No, I agree. I think the first issue was really solidly paced. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then 
I, I didn't quite notice it as much in two because two, I'm like, okay, that's the issue where we're doing the the Starro stuff, right? Because that's what we did with with Nightwing for a lot of you know, the back half of that issue. So that's the the obstacle for the issue of to why we're not getting to the characters, uh, you know, straight away. But then this issue, a good half of it, if not more, is still Starro stuff. It kind of feels weirdly paced out because of that. Uh, so it does feel like these two probably should have been condensed into one. Mm. Um, and it does feel like, you know, let's say, stalling a little bit. Like, it knows it needs to be seven issues or whatever, but it's really only four or five issues of story. It doesn't feel like the worst example ever, because like I say that first issue was really well paced. So, yeah, um, we'll just have to hope it picks back up. Now we're into the back half, I guess, after this. Well, the point I was trying to make, I think, is that... <sighs> Because of the pacing, like I would be surprised if the last two issues take such a drastic turn with a different character. Uh, is was where is why I'm feeling like it's un it's unfeasible. But I mean, they may surprise me and do it anyway. And maybe the last two issues will be very differently paced. I, I actually agree. It's probably unlikely that they're going to swap the cast out and do something different for the last handful of issues. I think the the reality is you're probably right, and they're just somehow not dead. I'm just trying to find a more interesting solution. Uh, ultimately, or at least interesting to me, solution would be to just kind of upend the premise on its head. And oh no, the heroes did lose, and we need more heroes. That's t- to me, I think, is more interesting than just this cliffhanger of oh they're all dead. Oh never mind, no they're not. Which is the the usual thing, right? Uh, it's not like it's the worst cliffhanger because we see it all the time, uh, but it's more just it's kind of meaningless. Yeah. Um... But there's one thing and what you hope they're going to do and what they are going to do. So I, yes. I don't know if I necessarily expect them to do anything other than just the typical, oh, somehow they're not dead. They've given me just enough in the issue to think it's a possibility. Mm. Right? Um, but also not enough that I think they're actually going to do it. I, I, I still think it's quite unlikely. Uh, but yeah. It's yeah. Uh, it's an okay issue. I, I will suggest this is a weird, weird complaint. Uh I really did not like the title page. Um, so they, they had the, the, the story title come up where Doom Metal, and it's like made out of the little stars and the like luminescent stars, and they were so bright, and the way it was placed on the screen, I struggled to kind of make out essentially you know, what the words were. I was like, what, what is this doing here? There's all these just like luminescent lights in the middle of the screen. It, it, it took my eyes refocusing a couple of times to actually kind of figure out what it was. I think it was just... A bad choice of colouring, spacing on the stars, perhaps. I, I don't know exactly. I, I just don't think it was the right choice. It distracted me from the rest of the action that was going on on the page, trying to read this, these words in the middle that were ultimately just meaningless. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I still had a decent bit of time with the issue. Like, it's, it's not like... I, I think this tie-in arc from Justice League... The, the first one was definitely the best one, and I felt a little bit the pacing last time, but... It was intriguing enough by the ending. I, I think this one, though, when it kind of we, we wrapped up the Star Wars thing and it was still about getting to Jean and still about getting to like, these characters, I, I kind of just felt like, I mean, you could have just taken all the Star Wars stuff out and this could have been one issue. <laughs> like, this could have just gotten straight there. Uh, but maybe, maybe it has to fill five issues, so there's a little bit of, like, stalling going on. Or... It, it does feel like there's a an editorial mandate of, we've got this many issues until Endless Winter, and that's when the book's being commandeered. We need these issues filled by death metal tie-in. Yeah, uh, it, it definitely has that feeling to it. So, but it's not a bad read either, though. I, I, I think you know. It, no, I agree. There's, there's some interesting beats there. The art's pretty solid. It may not be quite as good as Zermanico, but I think Robson Rock is a, a, a solid artist. And like I say, that mm-hmm. two-page spread with the Omega Knight, I think, it looks really good. No, the, there is a lot of in a vacuum. I would say, yeah, though this this issue looks really good. I think coming off of two issues as a Manico hurts it. Uh, just, just kind of, it, it feels like a bit of a drop after that, even though it's actually quite good uh, in its own right. What are you giving it? Uh, I'm giving it a six point five. Yeah. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Six point five. I just, I've tried to decide if I wanted to go higher or lower, and like. That neither one seemed appealing, so I guess I just agree with you. But um, <laughs> you just really don't want to agree with me. No, it's not that. It's just more. It's it's, it's more. 
I would rather give a solid number than a, a half if I can help it, but sometimes mm. that's just where something lies. Um, all right. So uh, Catwoman, issue 26, Ram V writing, Fernando Blanco on the art. This, of course, is the first, well, not the first full issue, because he, he technically wrote first, the first full story, but... First regular issue. Yes, yeah, first regular issue of this new run on Catwoman. And... I have to say, I'm very impressed uh, so far with this first issue. As a crime book, which is setting up a new status quo, a new location, a potential villain, and various other factors, uh, including, like, you know, you've, you've got the uh, the cop who was from earlier in the run that, you know, popped in, in issue 25, who's still sticking around. Um, various features, the idea that Penguin here at the start has hired a hitman to come after Catwoman because of what she did in 25. Uh, all really solid stuff that feels like, even after just this one issue, and, and okay, technically it's the second issue of the run, but in terms of, like, okay, that, that first issue, because when we talk about issue 25, it was really just that one backup that set up this new status quo of her moving to this, you know, uh, alley town. Here, though, in one issue of, of the, the, the regular part of the run, it's already established so many moving parts that by the end of the issue... I, I felt so slickly, like, settled into a groove where there, there, there's multiple things going on in this alley town. You've got Catwoman, you've got her kids, you've got this assassin, you've got the cop, which is tying in to the fact that he hears about this assassin coming to town, but not knowing why he's there. And then you've got the different mob bosses going on, yeah, the their relationships. Yeah, different mob bosses and how Catwoman's going to try and take them both down. Um... And, you know, it's like, okay, she's been a bit more of a criminal, but she's intentionally going out of her way to take down the meth, like, empire, because she doesn't want meth on the streets. You know, there's there's some, you know, heart of gold uh, qualities there's, in there. There's, there's things, she'll allow some crime, you know, some thievery. Yes. Um, but, you know, hard drugs to the kids, that's a big no-no. Uh, question, though, when, when Penguin called this hitman Mr. Valley, were you starting, were you trying to think about how he connected to Jean-Paul? No, because I just read it as Valley. Even though I agree there is the extra E in there. Yeah. Kind of just read it as, as Valley. I, I was trying, I was like, how does this get to Asriel? And it doesn't. <laughs> but um, I, I was trying to, like, wait, is, did Asriel, like, really change his look? What's going on here? <laughs> this is yeah. really different. Uh, do you know what I will say about this issue? I have very little to fault about this issue, and that's not to say I'm going to give it, like, a flawless score at the end. Because I don't think it goes, like, above and beyond and wows me either. It does everything that it needs to do to an extremely high level of quality is like, it, you know, it establishes all these moving parts. It, it eases me in, but it does feel like the start of a story as well. It's not like immediately out the gate, like bang, this is something phenomenal, but it's such finely crafted. It feels like a really well-crafted comic book from the type of serialized comics that I feel like maybe he's been lacking a little bit. Like everything these days typically has to go with a bigger cliffhanger or with a bigger, a moment. I don't know. There was something about the the ending where it was just like so. The book ends the issue for a start because the opening scene is this hitman being hired. Is this this uh, Mister Valley being hired? And then Father the Valley, Father Valley. Sorry. And at the end of the the issue, the final beat is that we've been just been, we've been having all the gang stuff play out and Catwoman and all the other things we've been paying attention to, and we've not really been thinking about him too much. All in the fact that the the cop finds out that he's in town and that he should be concerned about that, tying all the plots together a little bit, which is kind of nice. But the the last page is just the it's just this Father Valley's watching her from across the street with some binoculars, right? It's, he's just sort of you know surveying his prey, and you know he's very eccentric. You know it makes it he makes it clear at the start that it's his choice of how she'll die. He clearly takes a pride in his work and maybe enjoys it. All he these likes things. To put in the Bible. Uh, yeah, he's very religious, as the name Father Valley might uh, imply, and. But there's something so simple about it that it feels like it's just teasing the next chapter of the story where I feel like I got this sufficient chapter that introduced me to so many things and left me kind of, like, tempted. Because it's not... I don't think the end of the issue is, like, he's going to strike and there's going to be a big fight next issue. It doesn't have that feeling to it. It has this feeling, like, no, no, he's there, he's watching. Maybe his first, like... You know, because maybe he plays with her a little bit. Maybe he, like... He's, he's, uh, he's learning. He's there for information right here now. He's not here to, you know, make his move. Right, no, it, it is. This isn't gonna, you know, open with the next issue of him making the move. It's no, no. He, he's he's learned something here. He's learned about this relationship, and it's like, okay, that's something I can use, but not something that he's going to act on, you know, right this second. 
that's Catwoman's relationship with her sister, uh, for context. Yes. Um, but he, he uh, I don't know, there's just something about the cliffhanger that felt more old school to me in a way that not enough comic books do, I don't think, anymore. Um, mm. And I really appreciated that. There's so many moving parts. Uh, you, you, you've got Catwoman, and it's very stylized. It feels like a crime drama. You know, the, 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 the two-page like layout where it's explaining the two crime bosses. And it's like the, the map of the, the of Alley Town in the background. And um, I thought it was really clever what they did with this, where because there's three characters it's introducing, um, and each one uh, obviously it has their name underneath them on the on the panel itself. But if you look at one of the adjacent panels to each of those characters, it mentions their character in one of the uh, narration boxes as well. Uh, so it's just this, uh, you know, this subliminal, uh, you know, just connecting them, to, you know, to the name. Even if you didn't, if you if you happen to glance over the the name on the on the image, you got their name in the text as well. And because by nature of it being next to them, you connect it subliminally. That was a really weird way of <laughs> basically to to say this the the other way around, which I think is the way it's intended, is that you read the narration like you do, um, and when it mentions the context of who these people are. You get, what this essentially gives you the effect of is if you're watching like a movie that's kind of stylized and it, like you know when the character mentions like who a certain mob boss is it cuts to a shot of that mob boss with their name coming up in a big fancy font to well, make it very no, clear because why i didn't use that analogy and i think it's very important is because it's not always done in that order sometimes you will see the the character pop up first and then in the next panel it has a narration box that mentions that character's name uh, so it's not always done the you know is that style of cutting away like you like you kind of felt there. Um, it still reads that way to me, but this is more down to how uh, I read comics. Um, I read the narration boxes first. They are like I don't necessarily pay as much attention to it until I've got context. Even on like a page like this where it's split up into panels essentially with the map and it kind of leads you across. Oh, so especially on a page like this because the boxes are going in such a specific order. I read the boxes for context first. Uh, right, the... but um, like the, the the point for me here is uh, Pitt Rollins uh, is the third character here introduced, and you have that page, sorry, that page, that panel over there, and you don't actually get the narration box with that name in until after you've seen that image, uh, assuming you read it in the order that you're supposed to. No, whenever it's a trailing of narration boxes like this, I'm reading the boxes, and then my eyes are jumping to things that are relevant to the boxes as I'm reading it. Uh, that's just how I always read pages like this. Um, so, because to, to me, the order of this, because there's, there's panels in this that are, that are, for lack of a better word, useless. And I, I'm not saying that as a critique. There's panels here that are just parts of the map that mean nothing to us. They're not there really there. There are some like that, yeah. Right? So this isn't, a, this isn't a page where you read just left to right in the nine panel grid or thereabouts. It's actually, kind of, it's like three and a half panels because of the way the map layout. But... You know, you read typically that way in a normal copy because each panel is its own thing with a you know some either some art in a narration box or maybe without just art on its own, whatever. But it's telling a sequential story. Here, it's not quite that. Here, this is more like this is more like uh, for the fact that it, the map in the background is in like a grid that's kind of like a comic book layout. It's kind of almost just happenstance to what this actually is. This is a lot more like a fancy layout where. The order is a bit more free flow, and it's a bit more wherever the narration box wants to take you. So, to me, I look at this page, and my first instinct is like, oh, this these narration boxes are snaking around a spe specific way down the page. They're not panel to panel. And because of that, the way I was reading them was kind of like that. And it's not that I don't notice the, the panels with the art in them. I see them there. But it's a sort of thing where I get to the context, and if I... Well, I will make one small complaint here, is I do think the text that's on their panels with their names is actually kind of hard to read in two of them. Um, uh, I agree with that. It's a yeah. colouring choice, I think, more yeah. than anything. Pet Rollins is nice and easy because the, the blue car makes it really easy to read the name because the, the text is in red with a yellow uh, background. Uh, the other two panels, especially the, the cop, the dirty cop, his is impossible to read. Like I, I agree. I think there's a weird problem where they, they, they knew there was a... I, well, okay. I think they knew there was a problem with reading these, and that's why they added the white drop shadow to to try and make it more legible. Is that a yellow? Uh, I mean, maybe it is. I'm looking at it just at the size of it. Uh, maybe it is yellow behind it. I, I don't know. Uh, I thought it was white. 
I'm zooming in. No, it's, it's white behind it. Is it? It looks yellow to me, but... Uh, right, and that's kind of the problem. I think they, they were aware there was a problem with the readability, and that's why they added that. I think it kind of made it worse, on, especially on a Colic. Is, is that it? Colic? Colic, yeah. Uh, you know what? There's a reason why black's the one they usually go with. Black would have made it easier. <laughs> no, I agree, yeah. Uh, and, and last thing, I think it works fine on Pit Rollins because it's red against blue. Uh, so it stands out. Uh, the other ones have some readability issues. I, I, I definitely agree with you on that. Um, so, no. Um, that's kind of... Yeah. So, uh, whatever. We're debating about the order of things, but I... To, to me, I, re I read the stuff in the narration boxes, and then I I like that the, the panels of who these people are popped up when it was relevant to them, and they were neatly labelled. So having their names there, even if I couldn't necessarily read them. In fact, to be honest, the, the, the first one, when I got to the... I, in fact, do you know what? I think I, when I got over to Pit, I realised that their names were in the boxes because I didn't even notice <laughs> that at first glance. Oh, really? <laughs> and I went back and checked, and then when I really tried hard to read the first guy's name... I was like, oh yeah, that's just the guy's it's name. It's that one in that panel next to it, yeah. So, so he's labelled. Uh, um, what, what I think is, is interesting about this, just in the way that we read comics slightly differently between us, clearly. I'm not saying you know, one of us is right or one of us is wrong. Uh, the reason that I read their, their, the, the character panels more uh, before, you know, I, you know, I think uh, example is I saw Pitt Rollins and you know her picture before I got to that panel is because it's not part of the map. Like you say, there's a lot of dead space on this page of just, oh, this is just part of the map and you don't really need to be seeing that. Because their panels aren't that, they stand out and they catch my eye more. So my eye gravitates to that before I got to reading their name in the in the narration box. Yeah. Um, it is different when there's a splash page. Splash pages capture my eye first because they're supposed to. They're supposed to be a big visual moment. Yeah. Uh, this is different. This, this layout in this page and all these text boxes this is a montage. This is a montage with someone talking over it. And I, I always compare it to movies just because it's easy to kind of like correlate like how, how the feeling they're going for. And that's very much what this page is. Uh, you, you can see that the, the montage happening yeah. essentially in your head as you're reading through these narration boxes explaining who all these characters are. Uh, so basically, yeah, so you've got the, the guy on the, the left there whose name is like, was it Nahegan? Something like that, yeah. Something like that. Um, he is the meth dealer, so he's the one that Catelyn really wants to go after. Pitt Rollins is the leader of the gun runners who supply guns to the meth guys uh, for a price. And then there's a dirty cop, Colac, who basically turns a blind eye and offers protection to all the bad guys uh, for a price. So it's just kind of setting up all these things. And then the Catwoman makes a point of uh, stealing stuff. Uh, she's really just stealing information, but she she breaks into the meth guy's like sort of like uh, one of one of his locations, and uh, we actually cut to like the the police at the scene of the crime afterwards, uh, which introduces that Hadley's still around. That's the detective that we we met really properly last issue. But um, if you've been reading the whole yeah. book, this is a, a recurring character that I'm sure you're familiar with. Yeah, who's not from Gotham? He's from you know wherever uh, Catwoman was <laughs> in the earlier parts of the run. Um. But he's here kind of to aid, uh, and he gets a call from the FBI, tell him about the hitman that's in town, the Father Valley. But, you know, I, I liked how it told its story here where we see the aftermath and we kind of start to realize, wait, this is like one of these gang members that, that uh, or gang leaders, I should say, that, that, that Catwoman wanted to hit. And then afterwards, you know, we have her meeting with us, this rival, well, not rival even, it's the, you know, uh, Pet, the, 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 the gun runner. And she's very different, and Catwoman sort of presents the idea that, hey, I don't want meth on the streets, I'm going to do something that's a bit more nice, lower risk, you'll still be paid, uh, I'm going to take the other guy out of uh, business. Uh, and it's all very kind of sketchy at first, but it, it sets up the idea that, like, she knows that this pit's going to just go and rat her out, and she's planning for that. So it's setting up, so we're, we're sort of getting the, the motions that she's got a plan, we, we don't know what it is exactly yet, you know, we're seeing the first steps of it. We're not really seeing where it's going, though. Uh, it was a very, again, I know it's a very stylized page. And uh, uh, the flashback like to the break-in. Yeah, where she explains the break-in, so we actually get to see her sort of, like, fighting all these guys. Um, I thought it was a really interesting choice in that we have uh, Selena uh, superimposed across the top mm -hmm. with a couple of, you know, particular standout moments, and then just a lot of panels behind of all the, the minutiae of the action uh, that 
she is actively covering up in places, so uh, the, the, the superimposed image on top. Uh, I thought that was a, an interesting choice. Really effective, though, because it makes it stand out. It really makes it pop, especially, that's where I'm going to praise some, you know, the red outline. Uh, I think really kind of draws your eye to her in the middle, right? Uh, as a, you know, it's, it's almost the antithesis to the uh, the drop shadow on the on the words on the, on the previous uh, two page spread. Yeah, I, again, it's another really stylish two page layout, which again gives you this idea of of a montage. It gives you the idea of her sort of telling the story as we we get the big bold sort of ideas of it. Um, you know, I, I especially like the two sort of wide panels at the top of the the kid sort of causing the distraction by throwing in the uh, the smoke bomb or whatever it is he's throwing yeah. in the window. Uh, so I think it's like maybe a tear gas grenade. Um, but you know, and then Catwoman coming in, and then once it actually gets to her just fighting them, it's all just these very similar sized panels. Um, I really like that they're just just off like off kill there a little bit on a slant, just give it that sense of motion. Uh, you know, mm. everything's just leaning slightly to the right just just ever so slightly but just enough that it that you feel that forward momentum throughout everything i like the coloring uh on the next page as well especially i like how the blue becomes more green as she's like strangling this big I guy love the coloring throughout this um the 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 stuff with pit rollins in the, the the strip club all the the like neon lighting you can feel yeah. uh great stuff I mean, the colour is good throughout. I think this flashback stands out because it's a, just a bit more stylized than its choice of colours. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it makes a point of showing you her, like, scratch the car, which we saw previously with the cops. Like, that's why they think there's, like, a bit of an animal or something. Cause that a was a, a really nice transition that I liked uh, that you've just reminded me of. Because uh, a lot of, uh, you know, movies and stuff will do this where they'll they'll start a sentence and they'll cut to a different scene and the person will say a word that would have finished the, the previous sentence, but is also the start of theirs. And um, the the word that would have finished it was claws, uh, but it cuts to a guy named Klaus, mm -hmm. uh, someone saying that. I thought that was a really smart, just enough that it works on a visual level, but I don't think you can get away with on a verbal level. Um, so I thought that was a, a clever use of the medium. No, I'm just going to call him Klaus. He's not getting called Klaus. <laughs> It's it's I just I love it because it's the sort of trick you can only get away with in text where we see it we understand what you're doing and still you know in real time convert it. But think, if you just say that out loud, I think there's a second of disconnect that you have to think about it. So Selena leaves uh, this meeting with Pet, and Pet immediately she starts like texting you know the other bad guy, and Selena's like yeah I'm counting on her doing that yeah, as she drives off with uh with her her buddy who was interested at the start of the issue, um. I think it's the next page. There's a, there's a page after this with just three vertical panels of uh, the 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 meth like uh, boss, the meth the meth mob boss is what I'm trying to say, uh, getting this call. And then the middle panel is uh, Hadley with you know the murdered board with the red strings, where he's got all the crime bosses and the assassin on the board. And then the third panel is just like Selena's apartment and kind of like just before she's arriving home. Or, and I think this is the page where I sort of realized just how greatly constructed this issue was where i got to this page with these three panels and it gave me all these things that were going on and none of it felt confusing none of it felt like it was overstuffed it set up so many moving parts to the story and i feel like it's really set up a world like a really good first episode of a tv show would where all of a sudden i understand this so when it does this i guess again if you want to use i mean i've, I've used the word montage far too much in this this review but if you want to again call us a montage of all these different things going on, this is this is your you know five minutes before the end of an episode of Dark montage, where everyone is before the end Play, playing the the slow song. Yes, um, and, and not really, but it, it, like it has that kind of thing where like, hey, I understand all these things. It set all this up, and you've only got twenty pages in a comic book these it's days to do that. Impressively dense, and yeah. in, 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 not in a bad way. Uh, dense in the sense of this this conveys so much different information in twenty odd pages. Right, this this issue. Yeah. There's so much going on, but no individual page feels like you're sat there reading it forever. It doesn't feel like it's overstuffed at any point, but there's just so much information that you learn by the end. Yeah, and the last few pages, Selena does arrive home, and uh, Shu is one of the kids, is watching Mad Max Fury Road with Selena's sister. Um, clearly, it's supposed to be Mad Max, and I guess Warner, Warner Brothers do own it, so I guess they're allowed to just do it without worrying about I it. Mean, there's no logos or anything, so they probably could have got away with it anyway. They probably could have done, but I, I think for safety, 
<laughs> so I'll pick a Mad uh, uh, Warner Brothers movie that I like. I should say, not a Mad Max yeah. movie I like. And well, that's... I mean, it's a good movie, so no one's going to complain. Uh, but you know, is is Selena with uh, her sister talking about how she's not even sure why she's doing what she's doing? She's you know, she said to someone else earlier that ah, uh, you know, she's here to show that she's still got bait, that she's not gotten soft, that she's still a cat woman. And it's like she's kind of wondering if she's lying to herself because she kind of knows, yeah, maybe maybe it is just to show them rather than what she actually is. Yeah, uh, but she has this sweet moment with her sister, and then that's when we cut to the you know the the, the assassin with the night vision goggles across the street, um, and it's just a really nice moment because again it has this thing where the sinister part here is not that he's watching Selena. The sinister part is that now he knows someone she cares about because one of the the things that Penguin mentioned at the start is hey. She's gone soft. Again, bring that idea back in. But she's gone soft. She has people she cares about. She has friends. She has family. Maybe a lover. And at this moment here is like, not only is he found someone she cares about, one of many, to be honest, that he could find potentially, but it's her sister who is in a wheelchair. So immediately it's like, okay, the most vulnerable person that Selena cares about is now on his radar. So that that's really what the cliffhanger is. And he's got a, is. he's got a smirk in his face as well, which makes it really sinister. It, it does. And it's it's again, it's not that they're in danger right now, but it's it's this intrusion on this this personal private moment that, that Selena and, and, and Maggie are having here. That yeah, you know, and, and like saying you know, the, the the implication of okay, now he knows. Now now there's a threat going forward. Uh, he's he's got this information. It's it's just wonderfully done. And there's also something really interesting in the art here, where he's had these uh, these blue shades on the whole issue. And there's something about him lowering the night vision goggles, and they've got perfect green circles on the goggles, and then he's got perfect blue circles on his glasses. There's something about that visual that just makes it... I don't know, like... <laughs> there's not, it's almost like... Often in like, stories, you'll, you'll have sunglasses, or you'll have like something that covers up someone's eyes be kind of... Like a mask or the idea that you're covering up the evil part of who they are or something to make them less human. You know, I, I, example I always go back to is that in Terminator 1, Arnold goes from not having sunglasses to having sunglasses, the idea that he's becoming less human as the movie goes on. But in Terminator 2, he starts off with the sunglasses and loses them because that movie's all about him becoming more human. Um, There's something here in that context about the goggles coming down, but he's still got another set of shades on that are equally, you know, dehumanizing uh it's just i don't know it's a wonderful little touch <laughs> no it is it's real good uh so ram v is firing on all cylinders and catwoman is quickly moving to the top of the anticipated pile yeah i think it's it's safe to say ram v is is one to watch going forward right yep um i've only read two of his issues so far but i have been impressed yeah obviously me and matt have been very much enjoying his uh justice league dark obviously that's not peter's thing uh, especially given that it was mostly just following on from Tynan's threads that you know you dropped out of, uh, but yeah, be- between that and now this as well, uh, it's it's uh, it's very promising. Hmm. So, uh, what are you giving it? Uh, Eight point five from me. <laughs> I don't have the nine. I, I was Ooh. very impressed with this uh, by the time I got to the end, but I realized just how much it accomplished by the end. And how I was into just all these threads moving into the next issue. I was like, you know what? There's a lot going on here. And I'm excited for more. So uh, that is Catwoman issue 26. Aquaman 64. Kelly Sue DeConnick is returning with Miguel Madoncha on the art. It uh, kind of felt a little bit jarring to, to get Kelly Sue again. It's been so long. Or it feels it, like so long. I mean, it's only two issues off. But uh, yeah, I, I think the big problem with this is that it it took a two issue break right in as the conflict of the main story was about to start and i have to admit as i was reading this issue i was getting the broad strokes and i was enjoying some moments i think it's a well, fairly solid issue i do think this will read better in trade when you can follow straight into it because there was definitely like a lot of character things where i'm like wait okay who was where and what was yeah who's and, who, you know <laughs> and this is one where I don't hold anyone responsible. We we know the circumstances around this, but mm-hmm. uh, Kelly Sue uh, needed some time to, to to do some childcare in 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 certain global situations. Uh, so obviously, she is not responsible for the fact that there was a, a delay. Uh, DC aren't. They did the best by okay. We got we you know they did a great job of getting a two issue fill in, which you know, we didn't love, but 
wasn't, wasn't terrible, and they you know they they kept everything moving smoothly. Is that I mean it's either that, or you just take two months off, and which that... would have had the same effect either way for us, right? Yeah, and the downside to that, uh, from a larger sense, is that there is this worry that if a book takes time off, that the people read like enough of the people reading it might forget it exists and just never come back, <laughs> which it does happen. So. But it, it does it does put this issue in a predicament where we're going into I think because there's only like one or two more issues of this yeah, one think, left. What's interesting is this technically is is part one of a story officially by the credits page, but it doesn't feel like it. And I think there's only like you say two or three left at most, including I, this one. I have a feeling they just renamed and renumbered uh, because of the break. I, you know, I, I assume this was just going to be parts four or five or something. It, instead, it feels like it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a big fight's going on in Atlantis. Orm's finally there. Um, Mira gets uh, basically taken out of the game by being possessed, for lack of a better word. The, uh, the, yeah, she kind of like this. Uh, what, what's what's the name of the, the thing that go the, the 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 water nymph that goes around her? I can't remember. Uh, Larnia. Yes, thank you. Yes. Basically, kind of just p- puts a shield around her so Aquakinesis doesn't go like outside of the range of yeah. her. Right. Yeah, so so you know Arthur has to fight Orm himself and refuses to believe that he's anything better. Uh, Dolphin through Linnea, like she hears Mira talking through her, and Dolphin tries to help. So Dol- I think Dolphin probably gets the best scene of the issue actually, where she gets this moment where she steps in and saves some people on her own uh, when she's running off to try and like you know help with things. Um, mm-hmm. And you also have. Uh, you know, Cetia getting taken out of the prison by Volko. He's going to show her something uh, when all this is going down. Um, you know, there's some good beats here. Uh, art from Madonna is not bad, but any, you know, I think there's some solid pages in it's, here. It's uh, par for the course, what I expect yeah. for this book, to be honest, uh, for, over the last you know, year or so. And that's not a bad thing. It's not. It's just not particularly spectacular. It's like, oh, this is what I expect. Yeah, it comes down to Arm, you know, wanting to be ruler, wanting, you know, pissed that Aquaman doesn't deserve to ever have been considered as king or as anything. And Aquaman kind of calls him out as being this jealous little boy. And this this fight happens, but he kind of tricks Arthur into being captured in a, essentially, a big sheet. <laughs> all of his, all of his uh, henchmen uh, tie and Arthur in. stabs him with his big, massive trident through the, through the sheet. Yeah, so the end of this, you know, I think maybe the most effective panel here at the end is the uh, the blood flowing from his uh, chest as he's lying there in the water, and Orm sort of goads him and says, you know, what are you going to do about it, Aquaman? Going to call some fish, and you do see that the 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 waves of his uh, aquakinesis. And again, I, I like that this is an established thing, even in, even in just this run, this particular visual effect. Yeah, is, is long established that you no, know, you see this at the end and. And you know he's doing something, you know, uh, even says next, who will answer the call? We don't know exactly what he's summoned, but no, it's it's going to be impressive, I'm sure. I do wonder if it ends up calling in the gods. Like, I wonder if they end up coming in as backup as well. If they get, if they either can mm-hmm. hear this call or maybe a fish passes it on, as silly as that sounds. <laughs> I, I get what you're coming from. In, yeah. in context of this, it made sense. I'll, yeah. I'll let you off. Um, yeah, I, honestly, it's a fine issue. The, the only problem is, is that for the first half of it or so, I was trying to remember what Volko what cared about or what his motivations were because I couldn't remember what he wanted to do before this Just issue. Rule Atlantis, the usual shit. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I couldn't necessarily remember you know some of the different contexts. Uh, you know, Dolphins try to prove that Orm was behind the kidnapping of Andy to like uh, solve some of these issues, but uh, you know, it's it's just a weird problem that it's not really the issue's fault. I think this reads perfectly fine as the next issue in the main story. It's just that the two months off really you know because then it's been three months since we read the last issue so it's yeah. it's a little bit tough to kind of just flow straight into it as if not i, I think it'd have been fine like if it was like a break between arcs it'd have been totally fine but because it was right at the, this big moment where everything was about to start this big fight and, was about to start and ultimately right at the end of the run as well and, and like, like i said the last time we read this issue an issue relevant to this story was july how mm. long ago does july feel <laughs> Uh, it was a while ago, so yeah, so certainly not bad. Uh, what are you giving it? Uh, I'm going to give it a seven because I do think it's a solidly good issue, and it's hampered by things I brought to the table rather than what it did wrong. Yeah, no, I'm going to give it a seven as well. I think it's a perfectly fine issue. It's just 
it's dealing with a lot of real world shit that it's really you know it, it's not his fault it's not the writer's fault it's not dc's fault it's not our fault it's no one's fault uh well maybe that one guy who ate a bat i suppose but other than that it's but no it one's did, fault <laughs> but it did ultimately impact <laughs> the experience it is kind of the point even yeah. if no one was at fault yes so seven out of ten uh there we go so yeah uh which actually takes me on to my patreon book so uh, last book of the week then uh which is uh, every month of course on patreon.com slash mailfish tv if one of the higher tiers you can make myself or connor read a book and uh, i've got a couple to do this month this is my first of two uh so i'm gonna be talking about american vampire issue 12 um and notably the art here is by someone different which i did notice when i was reading that so i, I did make a point of checking to see who it was um and it is a person by the name of danny gel uh, is a She's a, I, I'm sorry. It's 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 a it's, it's a weird name. I, 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 I'm going to spell it for you, right? The first name is D A N I J E L, Danigel, maybe. I'm, I'm I'm trying to just look up issue twelve, right? Issue twelve, and then the second name is Z E Z E L J. Zezel. Zezel? I don't know. I don't know, but I, I did my best. I think to, honestly, I think the first name is just Daniel. Honestly, it may be. Yeah, I think it. it I think it's Daniel Zezel. It's. I, I could be completely wrong there, but that would be my guess at saying that name. Mm. Daniel Zezel. Uh. So. Yeah. So the art is a bit different. Um. And I think the art style is pretty good. I will say my one complaint about the art in this issue of American Vampire is that for some reason Skinner Sweet's hair feels like. I don't like when I say it looks like dreadlocks, but it looks like really, really thick strands of blonde hair, as opposed to his what his hair normally looks like, which is just sort of, you know, long blonde hair. Uh, it feels different uh, to the point where I, I, I felt like I wasn't even looking at Skinner Sweet at first until it kind of made it clear in the narration that that's who I was looking at. So I'll get that critique out of the way. Um, and it's kind of there throughout the issue because it has to be. Uh, this issue, though, is kind of an interesting concept. It's set in the past. I mean, all, obviously all the issues are, but I mean, it's set in the... We're further back in the timeline again from where we were before. And uh, this is back in 1919. This is, like a, this is a prequel right before the, the first main arc. This is just a, a year or two before he meets Pearl in the first arc of the book. And it's about Skinner watching this uh, road show, essentially performing out, like, how he was shot by... Uh, by book the the you know the, the the lawman and sort of playing out a fictional version of that um uh, with the french guy who was kind of around at the time he's kind of running the show he's kind of this pt barnum style character and he's he's kind of watching this he doesn't really care he's he's talking about how you know the wild west is kind of gone by 1919 now and how it's kind of depressing all these people watching this shit and all, all the just the, the, how things don't match up like they're making book out to be, be this hero and scared to just be this like, cowardly bastard who's running away and he's, he's you know he, he kind of talks about he, there's like a, a bunch of guest stars here uh who he isn't necessarily i mean he knows all of them and like the you know the the, the host is kind of the french guy he's like he's describing like you know the, uh, all these great people and the skinner's narration kind of counteracts it for example, one guy says, you know, even a shotgun blast to the face, you know, couldn't kill this guy, this outlaw. And Skinner kind of is like, yeah, it wasn't a shotgun blast, it was like a cigar to the face, he was <laughs> he was useless. You know, it was just kind of him countering everything he says. But notably, it gets to uh, Miss Kitty, which is the last one. She was like the, uh, the, 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 the mistress at a, at a brothel, and Skinner didn't know her. And the guy talks about, oh, this was Skinner's, this was the one dame who could get to Skinner's heart and whatever. And, you know, he kind of talks about how he remembers her fondly and she'll, he'll remember how she was when she was younger. And Because you know, obviously she's aged quite a bit at this point and Skinner hasn't because he's a vampire. And Skinner's like, he's done. He's like, you know what, whatever, let's let these silly audience members, if they want to watch this crap, I, I, I have no taste for it. The exact the line I think he has is, uh, this is all the culture I can stomach. And he's walking away. But just as he's walking away, the, the host mentions that Miss Kitty uh, ratted him out. Like she turned him into the authorities, and that's what led to his, like, his, his, his downfall. And he just sort of turns around. And, you know, this kind of sets up the story where 
uh, he kind of like invades the show where the actor who plays Skinner in the the little performance, he's in his uh and he's like ten and he's kind of like getting his wig ready and he's complaining, oh, can you we can make this wig a bit thinner. It's, it's a little bit heavy on top." And then Skinner like decapitates him and just holds up his head and says, "How's that?" Uh, so a bit of dark humor as uh American vampire is known for, particularly when it comes to Skinner. I was expecting more of a ruse here, actually, because Skinner, within seconds of, like, the, the play starting, he just, like, kills, like, the other actor and l- lets the French guy know, like, who he is, and then he kind of lets all the, the people that this guy sort of roped into being the, the, the attraction, you know, all these old uh, outlaws and gunmen, and he gives them guns uh, with real bullets, and they shoot down this guy. And this is all just a precursor, though, because what Skinner really wants is to go and talk to Miss Kitty and ask her if she really did turn them in. And an interesting uh, twist here is that she says, of course I did, because you wanted this big ending. You wanted to go out guns blazing. You didn't want to grow old. And, you you know, like, I, I thought this was how we'd both go out. We'd both go out in this blaze of glory and uh, this side. Because he's, he's about to kill her. When, he's, when she says he did it, he, he's, the fangs come out. He's ready to go for it. Uh, but she's... You know, she kind of justifies it in this weird way that kind of appeals to him. Uh, and he kisses her and you know, he goes off and he basically decides that he's going to go to California and that kind of sets into, uh, you know, where he is in the first arc. Um, as far as far as an issue goes, it's, it's an interesting one because it, it felt like a very standalone issue, even though it's technically the part of uh, this arc. Um, I assume we're going to be following Skinner throughout the whole story and seeing where he is at various points and why he makes certain decisions. Um, the art is pr- pretty good. Like I said, that one complaint. Um, I, I think the Skinner rating is is on point. Like I, I think any time this book slows down and gives Skinner a chance to sort of get inside his head a little bit and let us kind of see how he views the world and why he will kill certain people like is he just like you know is he a joker-esque character where he's just wildly evil and will do anything at randomly at, you know no matter what are you just playing a game of chance or is there more of a a reasoning behind him um and bizarrely him sparing this woman when he kind of like realizes she did it oddly like for him in a way that she thinks he would have appreciated uh oddly gives him a little bit of empathy not a lot like you know he, he's done some pretty dastardly stuff and he's happily killed people left and right um you know a, a lot of this issue is just like sort of like him watching this this play and then like the moment you realize that he's turning back to deal with it, it you're kind of like even when he's watching it at the start you're kind of like is he going to just sort of snap and like kill everyone <laughs> is, is he going to like go down there and like make it clear what this says or because he, he even criticizes uh, their their portrayal of Book. He says, no, Book wasn't like this. Book was way more of a noble adversary than this douchebag. Like, you know, that's not the, obviously the, the exact dialogue, but that's the essentially what he's saying. He's he's critiquing how they're portraying his adversary because he has more respect for who his adversary was than what this shitty story is doing. Um, he has respect for this guy that hunted him for as much as he did uh, in his own way. So... I think it adds some, some complexities to his character. Um, admittedly, I I don't know if this issue is a complete necessity in the sense that I I don't know if I necessarily needed this standalone little story about why he went to California, uh, but it did add some details to his character, some just a little bit of an extra layer. Uh, and I'm curious to see what the next stories actually are. Is this kind of like almost an anthology going through like the periods we've already been through, with where Skinner gets to point A to B to C to D. It, it I can't almost remember. feels from description because I mean I have read the first twenty or so issues of this a long time ago, um, but it feels almost right now like a, a bit of a fill in arc. Like while we're waiting for you know Albuquerque to be back, yeah. ready. Yeah, I I think that's a fair idea. I which is okay, and I I mean I've read way past this. I just don't remember this arc very well, and maybe that's why. Maybe why I don't remember it very well is because it maybe doesn't stand out as much as the other ones. But mm. um, but it's not a bad issue by any means. I I would probably still give it a solid seven. I think if I'm you know if I'm rating it, um, there's enough in there. There's enough. Skinner is just an enjoyable character to read. Like he's an enjoyable character to watch, and you're waiting for his reaction to things. You're waiting for these things to play out. Um, 
But that's basically it. That's basically the issue. With with a bit of sweetness towards the end. Uh, but, yeah, there you go. That's American Vampire issue 12. Uh, so that will take us out of the part of the show where we pick our favourites of the week, favourite panel slash moment, favourite cover, favourite art, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we'll start off with favourite panel slash moment. Connor, what are you picking? Uh, I'm doing the two-page splash from Catwoman. Uh, the Sorry, not splash, spread. Uh, where it's the flashback of the infiltration slash fight. Okay. Uh, I think that's wonderfully told. Uh, I think I'm going to go with the final page of Catwoman. Um, I think that's mm-hmm. just what speaks out to me uh, a little bit. Uh, what's Very your good co- choice. What's your cover? Uh, it is. By the way, I, I, I just loaded up uh, League Comic Geeks to look at these. And uh, the site seems to have refreshed recently. It's, it's got like a nice slick overhaul. It's all in like a dark mode. Uh, it runs faster. I approve. Um, yeah, I saw but, that earlier. <laughs> uh, I, I like it. Um, I, I'm going with the uh, the Jenny Frizen cover for Catwoman. Okay, okay. Um, I'm just looking now because I didn't really have much of a chance earlier <laughs> um, to see what these variants look like. Uh, I actually quite like the main Catwoman cover quite a bit. Uh, yeah, that's nice as well. Yeah. Um, but there's usually a... Yeah, this is, this is what I was looking for here. Is this a Matina Batman? It is a Matina Batman uh, with Batman and Grifter. It's nice. It's not his best, though. Um, I think it's a little bit dark. Yeah. And I, I know he is a very, quote-unquote, dark and gritty artist and realistic, but it's a little bit overshadowed, uh, especially towards the center of the image. Uh, I feel it loses some of the, the detail that I feel like Matina covers shining. Yeah, I think I'm actually going with the regular Catwoman cover. Um, I like it's, the... Uh, Joel Jones, right? Yeah, yeah, it's got it's got the uh, you know Father Valley kind of in the yeah the background, and he's, he's kind of like looming over the city with Catwoman, sort of with all within his shadow. It's just you know, it's just a really simple thing. Um, why it's been built at the top is Joker War collateral damage. Yeah, I think that that they're officially claiming this is an epilogue to Joker War, but uh, I feel that is a little bit tenuous. I, mean, I think. Do you know what I honestly think it is? I think it's to try and sucker a handful of people into buying a Joker War tie-in left over, realizing that this is a new run and hoping they'll stick with it. Very probably. The only justification for it, I suppose, is the fact that Penguin, why Penguin's hiring a hitman, is the only thing that ties it to Joker War. I, I thought it was interesting. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Batman did not have a Joker War banner on the top in the same way. No. I think, I think it mentions Joker War on the bottom in the text, but it doesn't have the, the, Joker, the official Joker War banner. Um, and I feel like that would have been far more deserving of it than this. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's uh, it's weird, but hey, that's what it is. Uh, so then, art of the week. What are you going with? Uh, it's Catwoman, uh, hands down. Yeah, it's, it's Cat. Yeah, it's not really in a competition, so yeah, it's Catwoman. Uh, okay, then rank your books. Go. Uh, ranking my book, Catwoman. Uh, <laughs> almost unsurprisingly, at this point. Is number one. Uh, I think I'll give Batman two, and then Aquaman, and then Justice League. Aye. Yeah, Catwoman at number one. Batman at number two. Aquaman at number three. Um. And yeah, Justice League at number four. Robin King at number five. I mean, I mean, the <laughs> look. It's a small week. It's like. Catwoman I, I think is the obvious standout. Catwoman is the only real standout. Like Aquaman and Batman weren't bad issues. They were both perfectly all right. But Catwoman was the only one that stood out being like as above and beyond. Like, no, this was a great comic this week. And I think it's a little bit of a shame that this is probably a you know, below average week in that sense. Like, there's only really one book that stands out like that. Uh, it's a little bit disappointing. But it is a small week. So, you know, hope for the best going forward, I guess. I mean, hey, just sometimes it lands like this. There's, there's, it's not like they sit and plan out and we'll make this week a mediocre week with only one great oh, book. Of, of course so, they don't. It is what it is. Um, but hey-ho. Um, yes. Um, also, people may be wondering, actually, we should probably explain why White Knight's new book's not on the list this week. Oh, yeah. Because people, a- people will ask <laughs> why the new White Knight book isn't here. Um, basically... Uh, <sighs> Hey, this is more of a, a a moral choice than it is anything else to do with the book itself. Um, 
Sean Murphy uh, kind of associating with people who yeah, makes it, it hard to support his work. Yeah, it all came about uh, during the, the, the Black Lives Matter protests earlier this year. It's kind of when it all came to light, at least for us. Maybe, maybe some people knew longer. Uh, yeah, there, there was some stuff he said during that that didn't really rub us the right way. And then there was like, oh, you know, he's, he's really good friends with a lot of gators and stuff like that. And it was like, oh, well, do you know what? I don't really want to support his work anymore. I don't want to read it, which is a shame because I enjoyed White Knight, uh, especially the, the second one. But I don't really want anything to do with that. Yeah, because uh, presumably people are going to ask and be like, why, why is this just a mist from the show as if we've forgotten it exists? Uh, we didn't. It was, it was more of a, a, a conscious choice. Uh, so also, actually, one last thing before I get to any of the uh, plugging and whatnot. Uh, Matt did message me. Oh, uh, did he? Did, yes. did he tell you what's coming next week in his, in his message? I think it, I'll get to that in a minute. Right? Now, he, just, okay. he said he'd read Batman and he wanted to say he was glad that he was... Uh, he, he expected that Tynan's run was going to be about how Batman realizes he relies on tech too much and he's glad that the run seems to be shifting into this. Okay, he has to, you know, pare it down and go back to basics. Very... Uh, Matt friendly approach to Batman. Yeah, so uh, I I didn't see it till after we'd already passed Batman, so I thought I'll add it in at the end of the show. Uh, okay, so there you go. Uh, that's uh, that is that. Uh, also, he's not fond of the art, but that's not surprising uh, <laughs> because it's Gallimard. Almost, almost a given, really, isn't it? All right. So yeah, as, as for what's coming next week, uh, we have Detective Comics one thousand twenty nine. The Flash 764, Action Comics 1026, Wonder Woman 765. What happened there? No, I'm just realizing. For some reason, I thought we were earlier in the month, and I'm just realizing it's week four next week. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> weird. Uh, we have Batman 3 Jokers issue 3, Batgirl 50, Red Hood Outlaw issue 50, Justice League Dark 27, Batman Superman 13. Batman Beyond 48, Dark Knight's Death Metal, Rise of the New God, Issue 1. Not Gods, just New God. Uh, I think that's an important distinction. Uh, John Constantine Hellblazer, Issue 11, Suicide Squad, Issue 10, Legion of Superheroes, Issue 10, uh, and then that last God, Songs of Chil- Songs of Lost Children, Issue 1. Um, whatever that thing is. So, <laughs> you, you can uh, look forward to that. It's actually quite a healthy number of books next week. Hey, so, I think, assuming you've, you're not planning on going back to Legion, I think we've got about nine books between the two of us. Reasonable amount, reasonable amount. Um, especially since you're back on Flash, you'll be... Uh, uh, I will be, yes. Uh, yes. And obviously, jo- uh, Three Jokers should be meaty, if nothing else, right? Oh, yes, we'll see how they wrap up that bad boy, which uh, issue two is a bit more of a, a mixed bag. So. I will say, it's almost a shame that none of us are, are reading Batgirl, because that issue 50 cover from Middleton, just not even the variant, the regular cover, is so gorgeous, I would have probably chosen it as the, the cover of the week next week, but it won't be eligible, because none of us will be covering it. So I'll just shout out here. That's a, that's a crying shame. Uh, but there you go. Uh, that is what's coming next week. I will take this time to thank our Patreon producers for the month. So thank you to Tyler Hess, Cindy Palisades, David Short, Bored Now, Al Tribesman, Christopher Moy, Brett Williams, and David Brown. They are Patreon producers uh, for the month of October, uh, which means they are all patrons at $20 or more on patreon.com slash TV. You can support supporters over there for as little as $1 per month, though, uh, and you get bonuses for your likings and whatnot. Uh, you get the $5 tier, you get early access to the show by a day, uh, and you get the access to the show whenever it's ready on the Saturday night. Uh, as soon as it's out the oven, I'll put it up for patrons uh, before the Sunday release uh, that everyone else gets. So go and have a look and see that. Uh, I will also remind you that Previously, the multiverse will be returning in November, so look forward to that. It probably it's still bi-weekly, I imagine, and I mean every other we week. We have a tentatively scheduled it for that for now. Yes, yes. Uh, that's every other week, not twice a week. Just to make that clear, <laughs> just in case anyone's thinking. I mean, we, about... we can try if you really want, but it's a big ask. Yeah. Um. So look forward to that, uh, and obviously, as far as supporting goes, if you can't support us on Patreon, that's okay. That makes sense i understand not everyone can you can support us in other simple ways such as hitting the like button on youtube just hitting is that, is that it hit maybe uh a light tap of the like button just tap just tap and just tap there's a little tap yeah yeah, yeah. Tap-a-roo. Don't, don't, don't screen if, if you're on a mobile just uh, so it's all, it's, all 
It's all in the hips. Just all in the hips. It's all in the hips. I don't know why I'm doing a Happy Gilmore reference with this, but it's all in the hips. Um, it seemed, it seemed like a strange choice here, here and now. Well, it should be Halloween's all the rage right now, so I guess <laughs> I've <laughs> added silence I'll be on honest, the brain. I had completely forgotten that existed already. I, I don't know how. I mean, I mean, it's clearly the biggest film of 2020. I mean, it's, it's... When, when's the Screams review? Um... Oh, that's coming up. It's coming up on the thirty uh, first of November. Look forward to it. Um, so the, we, uh, yes, yeah, so support us that way. Comment and uh, rate the podcast on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts from. Five stars, all that stuff. Stuff, all that stuff does help us. Is of course just you know telling people about us, spreading us out. Share us on Twitter. Say hey, you like comic books? You like DC? Maybe you'll enjoy this. Uh, that's all. All those sort of things. They all help. Uh, otherwise, is there anything I can tell you about? Oh yeah, DC Comics, at DC Comics Podcast on Twitter. If you want to follow us on there, go do that. Uh, but otherwise, that is us, so thank you very much. And once again, I will direct you all to go to Matt's Twitter, at Matt of Steel 57 and tell him you love him, and show him support. Uh, and you know, well, like you did last week, by the look of it. Yes, uh, you know, fondle him a little bit, uh, you know, digitally speaking, of course, uh, to <laughs> make him feel better. We'll do that. Uh, but yes, uh, that has been the show. Thank you very much for watching or listening. We always appreciate it. Keep reading DC Comics and remember to never get lost in the Speed Force. Bye.